So, uh, welcome every this, welcome everyone to the um, October 10 meeting of the Santa Barbara City College Board of Trustees. And we'll start by uh, asking those who wish to participate to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'll note for the record that uh, all trustees, including our student trustee, um, are present uh, this, this afternoon for our meeting. First item on our agenda is uh, uh, recognition. Each month the college recognizes the longevity and dedication of our employees. The board recognizes the impact that these employees have had on students, the institution, and the culture of excellence, that's the hallmark of Santa Barbara City College. We have three uh, employees to recognize uh, this evening. First one is somebody well known to all of us, Elizabeth uh, Oshenklaas, 30 years as a technical service specialist. <laughs> and Jim Clark is here to uh, Make the presentation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the board, Dr. Benjamin, members of the audience, I'm honored to speak to you today about Liz Auchincloss. Uh, she started her career here at Santa Barbara City College as an adjunct faculty member back in 1987. She worked as an adjunct for about 20 years, uh, mostly in the CNEE department, and that's actually where I met her in the mid-90s. I was one of her students in a cabling certification class. And, uh, you know, I found her actually be a very patient instructor. She was very thorough, um, didn't tolerate a lot of back talk in her class, and that was good, because um, it was mostly coming from me. But uh, I found her to be a very great instructor. And, so it was, you know, it was kind of a nice surprise when I came to work here and, and found I was going to be working with Liz. Um, her classified employment began in 1989. Uh, she worked half time as a lab teaching assistant uh, in the electronics department, which is now CNEE. And the other half of her time was spent as a computer technician. And that was back when the college had just a few desktops. There was really no network. The internet was at its infancy. So half time was plenty of work for that. Uh, about 1990 or so, she became a full-time computer support technician in the newly formed uh, ET and MS department. Um, and in about 1992, she became a user support specialist in the newly created IRD department, which was institutional, or excuse me, information resources, resources division. That was what that was called. It became IT uh, a few years after that. Uh, actually, she became a technology training specialist while she was in IRD, and then that became the uh, IT department, and she became a technology services specialist, which is the title that she still holds today. She uh, was the technical lead with oversight of the Staff Resource Center, which was a training center that we had here that was the staff equivalent of the faculty resource center that we have today, where she provided training in a computer lab environment on various software packages that were uh, implemented here at the college. Um, the, that lab is no longer in existence, but Liz still provides training to this day on software. Um, she maintains the uh, site licensing for all of our desktop software. Um, she's responsible for computer receiving and inventory management in our tech shop, where all the computers and, and all equipment comes in. She builds and maintains all of the computer images that go out on computers, so any computer that leaves our tech shop probably has an image that was built and deployed by Liz. And she also does software troubleshooting and support for our staff on campus and faculty. Um, most people know her on campus for her roles in various committees and in the CSEA, where she started early in her career as a chapter treasurer, then chapter vice president, and for the last 20 years, she's been the chapter president of the CSEA. Um, I've been her supervisor for 
about 12 years now and uh, found that she's always been a pleasure to work with. Um, she provides excellent, excellent service and support to not only the staff and faculty that she supports on the technical side, but um, also on the CSEA side of things. She's very well respected by the people she supports there. Um, she represents staff with a genuine empathy and concern for their well-being. Um, she's highly respected as a key figure in our tech shop as well, where she is a very supportive influence. Um, she provides me with a lot of great advice and counsel. She's been here for so long, she knows the inner workings of the college so well that oftentimes I go to her and say, what's the best approach for this? How, do, how was it done in the past? And then she has a lot of great insight she's very free with and willing to share. Um, I found that she works ethically and reliably and is a lot of fun to be around. So I very much enjoy working with her and I'm delighted to invite you all to recognize her achievement of 30 years at Santa Barbara City College. Good afternoon. Uh, 30 years ago when I started working here, I found a home. And because I'd worked in many different places before, out in private industry, but I found a place here. And with all the ups and downs, I love working here and I want to thank everybody that has given me the opportunity to work and serve at this college. Thanks. I guess we'll call Jim back up to uh do the presentation for Arturo Picardo, who's been with us for 15 years, also as a tech service uh, services uh, specialist. Hello again. Um, I'm also very happy to speak about Arturo Picardo today. Um, I've worked for Arturo for about the last five years. Um, he's got a nice, rich history here with the college. Uh, it's also funny, he goes, he goes back a long way. I know a lot about Arturo. Um, he, uh, when he was young, he was in the Mexican Army and um, did a lot of work moving rocks and marching and um, finally decided he wanted to do something different. And so his father suggested, hey, you know, the, uh, the, the, the band for the Army, the musicians, they, they don't do this picking up rocks and stuff. <laughs> they, they stand in a room all day and play music. And he's like, well, I don't know how to play music. I said, you sure you do. Anybody can play the tambourine. So they went and bought a tambourine. <laughs> and he showed up with his tambourine. And then he was part of the Mexican Army Band. And uh, finished his career out there doing that. Uh, came to the United States, uh, I think about 1988. Um, did a bunch of odd jobs. Attended UCSB for a while. Um, didn't really like the program there. And wanted to work with people and computers. And so he came over to Santa Barbara City College and graduated as a student of our CNEE program, uh, the Computer Network and Electronics, and uh, worked as a student worker for a while. Uh, his first 10 years as a classified employee were in the language lab, uh, where he was a senior instructional, it's senior ICLC, which is instructional computer lab, computer lab coordinator, thank you. Um, he started working for Dan Watkins, and uh, he was the right-hand man to Jason Walker for many years. And Jason always talked about how Arturo was his go-to guy for everything. And um, I got to steal him away from Jason about five years ago. And since that time, Arturo has been uh, stationed out at the Wake Center, taking care of the School of Extended Learning, uh, Wake and Shot campuses. He provides all the staff and faculty support there, uh, as well as our cosmetology and our Children's Learning Center. He's like a, a one-man uh, army out there just taking care of all of their needs and whatever is needed, and they love him out there. Uh, and it's really nice because he's so um, self-starting and so uh, confident and skilled that I can just kind of push him out there, and he doesn't really need much from me, but I'm there, you know, checking in when I can and find out what he needs, and he's always like, no problem, chief, I've got it. And, and he's, he's, he's diligent, and, and I really appreciate 
being able to rely on him for that. So it's been an honor working for him for the last five years, and, and it's also an honor to invite you all to recognize him for 15 years of service here at Santa Barbara City College. Members of the board, I just want to say that it's an honor working for Santa Barbara City College. And I remember the first uh, words that Dan Watkins told me when he hired me. He said, you're not only an employee of me, you're an employee of Santa Barbara City College. It's a badge of honor. And whatever you do at Saddle College, you're representing the college. Thank you. <laughs> The third um, uh, recognition tonight uh, goes to Chelsea O'Connell, who's been with us for 15 years as an office assistant uh, senior. And she's not here. Today. She's not here. So we'll still recognize her. <laughs> I think at this time. Oh, We'll do uh, public comments. Uh, this is a time when members of the public have the opportunity to directly address the board on any item of interest to the public that's within the jurisdiction of this board but is not an item noticed on the agenda. And tonight we have a speaker slip for one uh, person. So I would call down uh, Ms. Inda, Jacqueline Inda. Members of the board, my name is Jacqueline Inda. I'm here to talk about a specific issue, which is minors in possession. I want to inform you that in the city of Santa Barbara, there are several different programs that are part of a provider list at the court. When someone gets adjudicated or within the sentencing process of having either an open container or being um, under the influence in public, or under the influence of any other kind of substance, or particularly have a, a license that is not correct and it's not theirs, uh, those individuals usually get sentenced into a minor in possession program. In the city, we have two different programs. Historically, we've, ha we've had Zona Seca provide an organizational structure for individuals who are not enrolled in school who would fit properly to learn about what's going on in the community in general when it comes to substances. In UCSB, there's a program called CASE. CASE is really designed for UCSB students. Although they do take other students to the population that they serve, it's really designed to educate uh, students about what's going on in that population, what services they have on campus, and how they could better direct their energies. Now, these minor in possession programs are only about four hours long. The longest those programs actually are in the penal code are five. That's not a lot of time. In five hours, you're not going to straighten out your life and change things and do things differently. But you can utilize that time to really learn about something that might help you in the future. So we have gotten onto that provider list, and we are developing a program within those five-hour restricted amounts of time in which we would provide support to city college students. So that city college students who are referred through the courts into our program would go through an assessment process. It's a three-phase process in, in this new program. They would go through an assessment process and get a little bit more informed about what their needs might, need, might be. Once that assessment program is uh, processed, then they are able to connect to the second phase, which is what we call our exploratory program. The exploratory part of this service is an idea to get those students back onto campus and learn what their health fee covers, learn what maybe EOPS might do for them, connect back to their school-based counselors, go back to the and, uh, different facilities in this, in this community. The last phase of the program is to come back to us and in a clinical process, explain what they've learned and hopefully give each other guidance of maybe resources that they've learned about. 
So what we've decided to do with our program is to really develop a strategy in which people that are City College students would be mandated to come to our program based on the penal code, but then would use that exploratory phase to learn what's on campus. Being a City College student myself, I could tell you there, usually you're in the hustle and bustle of learning what's going on within your own class. You don't have time to learn what's going on on campus and all the great resources you guys have. So I come to you today really to ask you to maybe explore that a little bit more with us because we'd like to be partners with you. I'm part of the Santa Barbara Response Network. This program would be underneath that. And we have several MOUs with City College, one for adult education, which we're developing for ESL students, uh, and obviously the psychological first aid response, which we do with your faculty and your community when it's needed. So I'm here to ask for two things. One is to create a formal understanding or a memorandum of understanding for this project specifically with the City College, not because we're asking for you to refer clients, but so that we're in partnership as we refer out clients to your campuses and to your different facilities because they're City College students that we would automatically be a good fit and a good tie. And of course the second is to invite us to maybe come back and do a presentation to you guys in an agenda item so that you could really fully understand what that might look like. So I will leave my cards with you guys. I'd like to be able to have maybe you guys contact me and we could speak a little bit more about this. But it's definitely something that I think will better impact the community that you guys are serving on campus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next item we're taking out of order is 12.1, uh, the uh, College Foundation Financial Report. Mr. Green. Well, good afternoon. Superintendent President Benjamin, President Miller, members of the board. Um, I, I come bearing some good financial news. I know that's hard to come by these days, so um, I'm going to just extend this as long as we can. Uh, but, but today what I want to do is give you an overview of uh, our now completed audit for the fiscal year 2018-2019 uh, for the Santa Barbara City College Foundation. Uh, the full audit was in your packet. I know how much fun it is to read audits from front to back, so um, and the off chance that you did not all do that, I'm going to just uh, share a few highlights of what we found. Um, if we can go to page four, Liz, that would be great. Uh, right, uh, actually one back, let's start one back, there we go. Um, so I want to start with the overall net assets. So here, here's the good news. So this is a, all in all, it's a 24 page document. Um, but most of the critical data is, is right up front. So I want to just kind of share with you what the year looked like for the foundation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the revenue, the assets, the operating budget, which as you know has been the ongoing uh, project, uh, and then just a few other, other details. Um, let's start with the, the overall. Uh, this year, if you look at the assets, so the balance sheet, the statement of financial position, you'll see uh, if you're used to old style nonprofit audits, um, there was guidance that was issued about two years ago and they, it went into effect this year. So instead of having three columns of assets to talk about um, unrestricted, temporarily restricted, and permanently restricted, this year and from now into the foreseeable future, there will only be two. So you see up there uh, with donor restrictions and without donor restrictions, and that's essentially the new presentation model. It doesn't actually change how dollars are restricted or how we account for them internally, um, but the, um, the guidance now coming from the federal government is that this is how nonprofit um, assets are to be presented. So what I'll do is, is show you the, the highlights. So uh, what I'll ask you to do is actually skip all the way down to the bottom under liabilities and net assets. We'll jump right to the punchline. So the total net assets for the year uh, in the two columns, you'll see there Second line from the bottom, uh, third column over, $62,951,306. That is the 
position of the foundation at the end of the fiscal year, as of June 30th, and that is a new all-time high for us. Uh, that is net assets, so that is after all liabilities are taken care of, those are the assets of the foundation. Um, we're very proud of that number. It is uh, among the largest of our peer group in the community college system, and that speaks to the now 45-year uh, history of this community investing in the college uh, via the foundation. I want to then look to the left of that number. You'll see the breakout. The other uh, <coughs> exciting piece of this is that left-hand number of 3.86 six million that is unrestricted so those are actually assets that we hold um, that have been given without restriction by donors uh, what that means is that we then have that base of support to either handle emergencies uh, cover cash flow issues invest in major projects or whatever the need may be and that is rare for us as you may know a huge percentage and in this case actually at the close of the year 94 percent of our assets are permanently restricted uh, so although the number is large and we're proud of that, it is, it, all those dollars have been given overwhelmingly for very specific purposes. That generally means a specific scholarship, a program endowment, or a multi-year gift for some particular uh, program or effort at the college. Uh, but those are, those are outstanding numbers, and, uh, and that is the new breakdown of how we present them. If you look at the next page, page four, thank you, Liz. Um, this is actually the statement of activities for the year. Uh, so the other good headline, good news, if you look at total of 2019, it's the third column over, the first uh, underlined <laughs> line right there, 9591495 that was the total revenue for the year. So it was nearly a $10 million revenue year for the foundation. Um, if you look above that, you can see the component parts. So 6.2 million was actually raised. So those are gifts and commitments made during the course of the year. 2.1 million were actually the earnings, uh, the investment income. Uh, so again, and, and we of course don't control this, uh, but nonetheless, the strategy that we pursue is, is, uh, was working well this past year. Uh, and then you see other income and the changes of a couple of other uh, assets that we hold, split, it, split interest agreements. Um, and those are generally uh, tools where there is a, a donor still involved or multiple parties still involved. And at some point, it becomes the asset of the foundation. So charitable remainder trusts and the like. Uh, so anyway, that, that is a, an overview of where we ended the year. Um, if you go to the next page, page five, you'll see the functional expense breakdown. I tend to be shy about talking about this because this is what a lot of people have been educated to ask. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a great measure of the efficiency of an organization, meaning basically when you spent your money, how much of it went to run the operation, how much it was fundraising, and how much was program. So you'll hear people shorthand that as overhead expenses in finger quotes. Uh, and I, if you look at the bottom there, total 2019 expenses, you'll see that programs and services, so so expenditures of the foundation directly to students and or programs was $5.7 million last year. Um, so those are the dollars distributed. That's from a combination of dollars raised, endowments held, uh, a number of different ways that that can happen. Management in general, so basically the overhead of the operation, uh, $868,000. And then the fundraising just north of 900,000. The way that breaks down for people that measure it this way is a 76.4% program, 11.5% uh, admin, and 12% fundraising. So by folks that measure this, they would look at that and say that's a good uh, ratio. Um, nonetheless, it's not a great way to tell how well an organization is doing. Um, but we do, we are required to, to show that. Um, the other thing I'll look, if, if you look to the far right, the total 7.5 million, that, those were the total expenditures. And as I said a moment ago, revenue was about 9.5. So it really built the assets of the foundation by about $2 million last year. So that was the, the net raise in the, in the foundation. The, the remainder of the, the, um, the notes just explain the details of how we operate. It is a rather large, fairly complex foundation um, for, for a foundation of our type. So uh, if you have any questions at all, it's in there. It explains um, some of the ways that we account for values uh, for assets that are not cash. It explains a little bit about the real estate holdings of the foundation since we now have more than one of those. Um, and then, of course, it talks a, a bit about um, some of the invested assets and how those are invested and how they're held. So if you have any questions, I, I won't go into that right now, um, but that is uh, the, the total overview. The other number I'll point out is about 51 million are now part of our permanent endowment. So that is um, also a new high for the, for the organization. 
What I was just asking Liz actually a moment ago is I, I, we just finished uh, a financial dashboard that we do every year as well. Um, I, I don't think we, I got it in time to show it up here, um, but it's another just sort of a visual of looking at the numbers and, and what they mean. Uh, it's about a series of about nine different graphs and tables that kind of give you a, a, a four-year historical perspective of, of where the foundation is at. Um, I will say that we once again had a year where we had uh, a number of gifts in the seven figures, so these are million dollar plus gifts, um, and we're now getting those more regularly. You may know that that's a big jump for the community college world, uh, and this is sort of where we're at in the overall philanthropy and community colleges. We are, um, I, I would argue, coming into our own. Uh, I think donors and supporters throughout the country are recognizing more and more the, the value of dollars given to community colleges. Uh, it used to be that you only heard about the large gifts when they were going to Ivy Leagues and then ultimately to four-year publics, and now the community colleges are making their way up that that ladder, and I think it's a great trend because uh, you know a $2 million gift to a community college can be world-changing, um, and it doesn't necessarily register once you get up into the, the larger entity. So uh, that's where we're at, and, uh, and so we will continue to do do that work. And I'll, I'm happy, I'll happily take any questions if we... Thank you, thank you Jeff. I, I just want to note that yep. I, I heard a presidential candidate say this week or propose this week that, that community mm -hmm. college, that the government should pay for, I think he said, three quarters of the tuition for community college students. And I wanted to respond, well, we already pay 100% <laughs> to our foundation. So thank you for the idea, but we're, we're ahead of you. We're good there. Yeah. <laughs> any other, any questions or comments? Trustee, I just uh, wanted Ronger. to say thank you, Jeff, and to the foundation for doing such a wonderful job for uh, supporting the college and the students. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, and for highlighting the not so exciting numbers, but it, money's emotional for people. So yeah. I appreciate the foundation's transparency, even though it's, you know, an extra page, but the fact that you guys are willing out there to say, hey, we're here for the mission of the college, and here it is, not exciting, but we look good, and so thank you. Right. Absolutely. I want to uh, add, I want to thank you too for your performance. I recall before you joined the foundation, and when I first came on this board, uh, or about seven years ago, um, there was talk about the. There were a few of us were talking about the enormous potential for the foundation, and where it was at, and where we felt it should be. Um, I wasn't necessarily one of those that worked hard on it, but still, I was, you know, very interested and tried to help. Um, you came on and um, it was like a miracle. It's like you already knew what the potential was and you just went at it full bore. And the results are uh, what we hope for. And you have this great attitude, you know, that you can, that it's going to evolve even further. And I think with that attitude um, and a good plan, I think that will be highly successful and an example for others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Green. I think you can tell there's a strong support for the work you and the foundation are doing, so thank you. I appreciate it. I will say that to your last comment uh, that we are, I mean, that by no means do we think we're done here. So uh, <laughs> as, as we get more creative ideas and ways that we can help to, to be a good partner to the, to the institution, that's what we're here to do. So thank you. Now, uh, going to move to another item out of order, 12.2 uh, presentation by uh, LPA Architects concerning the new uh, PE building. So. Good afternoon. Good Board afternoon. Trustees. President <clears throat> Benjamin, uh, I'm just here to introduce this evening, this afternoon, uh, Mr. Stephen Flanagan. He's with LPA. That's uh, not an acronym. Their firm's name is LPA. They're the architect firm that we have selected for the physical education building replacement project. And he's here to give an update about that project for you. Thank you, Lindsay, members of the board. It's truly my pleasure to be here tonight. <coughs> what architect wouldn't want to have this opportunity? Santa Barbara, ocean view site uh, with 
this kind of scenery, this kind of climate, one of the most prestigious community colleges in the nation. And when we first saw this opportunity, we couldn't wait uh, to come to interview and have a chance to be selected. Now that we've been selected and we've just started to work, I'm here today to give you an update on the project. Once upon a time, I was a collegiate athlete and a kinesiology major. So working on a project like this is truly a combination of my passions uh, for athletics, uh, physical education, kinesiology, recreation, along with architecture and good design. And I'm with LPA. I'm a principal and the director of higher education. Uh, but I'm supported by over 420 design professionals that are changing lives by design every day. Uh, I have a core group of professionals that are truly experienced at doing this work. Uh, they include myself, uh, Silka Frank, uh, one of our project designers, lead designers, uh, Winston Bow, uh, programming specialist, uh, Jeff Schaub, a senior project designer, uh, Steve Key, the project manager. And you can see those numbers there. Those are years of experience. And for all of us except for Jeff, uh, we've had those years of experience together at LPA working on educational projects. So we're a truly experienced team working on higher education projects and working together. Jeff Schaub is a national expert, worked for the Power Five schools across the nation for athletics, uh, recreation, and physical education. So he brings a national perspective and experience to our team. And Albert Einstein said the only source of knowledge is experience. So I wanted to share with you a little bit of our experience just so you understand uh, where we're coming from and the type of uh, expertise we're gonna bring to your project. We just completed uh, the uh, Anaheim Ducks new training facility, the Great Park in Orange, California, but in total over 250 sport and recreation projects. Uh, 200 higher education projects, a lot of those are student recreation centers that accommodate physical education for the CSU system. Uh, community college experience, over 125 community college projects completed and I'm proud to say that 100% of our community college projects are closed and certified with DSA. Uh, this is another project, Mount St. Mary's. This is a private university, but on top of a hill site with ocean views, downtown Los Angeles views, we actually look down on the Getty Museum on this project. So uh, we're going to take that experience of uh, having this amazing opportunity, amazing gift of the site uh, for the project uh, for Santa Barbara City College. Uh, and then we just uh, finished the design for uh, UC San Diego for one of their new uh, student recreation athletic facilities on campus. Uh, this soon to start uh, construction, uh, as well as PE replacement complex projects. Three in total, this one at, at Rio Hondo College, you can see a $23 million project, LEED certified, has all the same components that we're looking at here, as well as one that's under construction, soon to be complete at the end of the year at Los Medanos College, another PE uh, project. This is not a replacement building, this is a new building. And then another replacement building at College of the Desert, uh, which is a lead gold project uh, that we finished, uh, we're very proud of. And uh, again, we'll take all this experience and we'll use that to make your project uh, the best it can be. And one of the things we're gonna do is work with your uh, design aesthetic uh, standards. Uh, that's something we're used to working with, with different universities and college, looking at what's important to you and trying to incorporate the, as many of those attributes into the design of this project as possible. So if you can look there, design uh, success criteria, strengthen the college identity across three campuses. So that's about uh, being contextual and designing something that looks like it belongs on campus and is a part of your district and a part of the community. So that's something we pride ourselves on. We're not gonna give you a landmark building that has the LPA signature on it, we're gonna give you a building that has the Santa Barbara City College signature on it. So think of us as your tools uh, for developing this project. Create equitable access. As we know, we have a lot of topography on the site, particularly just behind the physical education building. And so addressing universal access and solving the ADA problems is gonna be at the top of our priority. Uh, then of course, support sustainability. Uh, at LPA, we've completed over 225 lead projects, uh, which is a, uh, uh, leadership in energy environmental design and that's something we're very proud of and it's something that we just do as part of our natural course whether it's a lead project or not we're going to give you a sustainable building that's easy to operate low maintenance and has a, a great life cycle uh, return for you uh, then of course foster the community connection this building is right on 
uh, Pacific Coast Highway and the, the Pacific Ocean and has a very dramatic presence. Although the building now is somewhat uh, brutalistic and inward facing, uh, it doesn't really have that presence. And so we want to work with you and your team, your constituents and stakeholders uh, to deliver something that brings a wow factor to the campus and to the community. Then you see the overreaching uh, design concepts, design uh, the experience to support student success. So everything that we do as designers is about student success and making them successful. So every design decision we make is going to be about the student. Uh, maximize the natural resource. Again, that's just about being uh, sustainable. Uh, then using integrated design execution at LPA. All of our engineers are in-house. Uh, so we integrate all the disciplines, uh, whether it's structural engineering and seismic safety, <coughs> as well as energy and electricity. Uh, we have that all in-house working together from the very beginning, and we'll utilize that to make your project uh, very efficient. And then, of course, design for uh, safety and comfort. This is a Field Act building. We want to make sure that uh, it's safe and can be used uh, as a, a refuge, if need be, in emergency situations. And we, we, we all know we've had a few of those in the, in the last few years. So uh, something that's at the forefront of our thought. But when we start every design project, it's kind of like a jumbled up Rubik's Cube. We have a lot of different colors, uh, which are attributes of the project, uh, criteria of the project, uh, wants and needs. Uh, we have dollars and money that we have to work with. And so when you first start, it's kind of all jumbled up. But as you work through the project and you work with the stakeholders and you get their input and you get their buy-in, you get the board's buy-in, it slowly starts to uh, create targets for success. So for us, success is going to be hitting the target uh, square footage within 1% over or under, which is uh, very challenging to do, but something we've had great success in doing. A project that improves accessibility, again, that's uh, part of your standards and part of your design aesthetics. A project that bids on budget, of course, that's uh, paramount to your success. A project is designed to keep the overall cost of construction low. So not only do we want to meet budget, but we want to deliver a quality set of documents that's going to give the contractor a recipe, a set of documents that makes them very successful and minimizes change orders during construction. Uh, use 100% of the state allocated funds. If we don't use 100% of those funds, they go back to the state. So we want to make sure the students get the benefit of the state funding that they're willing to offer for this project. And a facility that is the pride of Santa Barbara City College and uh, the community it serves. So you see there in the bullet points, the, the Rubik's Cube is all put together. So at the end of every project, when you have a nicely designed and functional project, it's like the Rubik's Cubes come together and you think, oh, well, yeah, that, that looks easy now that we're here at the end. But getting there uh, is a lot of work, and it's something that gives us a lot of passion to be able to finish with the Rubik's Cube with all the colors on the right side. So like I said, this is an update. We're just getting started. Uh, we've really had one meeting and we have a whole set of meetings uh, scheduled for uh, next week. Uh, but here, I just wanted to talk a little about, about the project and the site. Uh, so obviously, this is an area of the campus and you can see the, the football field and the track and the stadium and the PE uh, complex uh, right next to that. And if we zoom into that, you see the existing building. So the state uh, allocated funds are for replacement of the building. So we have to replace it in kind in the same square footage it is as in the same location. So we can't really consider any other locations. This one's uh, uh, the, the place where you have to put it in order to get the state funds. But one of the challenges that creates is what do you do when you're building this? A PE building is a very hard place to, uh, or a gymnasium rather, is a very hard place to have interim uh, uh, activities moved to somewhere else on campus. There's very few gymnasiums in Santa Barbara itself or in, in a close location. So one of the things we want to start to look at is the logistics of how you keep the gymnasium during construction until you're completed the design of the building and then you can take down the gymnasium and maybe build some other component. But if we want to build a gymnasium right next to the existing gymnasium. So the first step would be to demo the existing locker rooms and classrooms and offices you can see in, there in the yellow highlighted area. 
and then use the gym during construction. So now that's something we'll work with the construction manager during the design process to see the logistics of that. Of course, we want to make sure safety comes first as far as student access. Uh, and so we have to be very strategic about what we build and how we build it and when we build certain components of the building. But we think this is a great strategy to demo this part first, use the interim uh, construction uh, class or during construction, use the classrooms, exercise area that are on the top there, as well as the gymnasium you can see in the bottom. And then we come in and we build either the new gymnasium in its entirety or a portion of the gymnasium. So you can see here we could build the gymnasium, entry, lobby space, classroom, exercise, dance, and weight room. Uh, then once that's complete, we can demo the existing gymnasium and build locker rooms and maybe enhance the outdoor space uh, where the old gymnasium used to be. So you can see here we call this option X. I didn't want to give you an option A or an option one to make it sound like that was our preferred option because we don't really have a preferred option right now. What we have is just some ideas, some concepts as you can see here. So I've labeled three different concepts X, Y, and Z. So this is concept X, but another way to look at this, uh, concept Y, is uh, what if you had the same strategy, but instead of building the classrooms, exercise and dance on the backside that is closest to the campus, maybe it's out here where you can really take advantage of the ocean views and you could have glazing so the people that are driving by can see the, the amazing activities uh, and education that are going on inside. And then you could have the amphitheater or more of a, a private type of outdoor space uh, behind that, the sort of terraces up the hill. You could create an amphitheater out of that. And then this particular scheme, the lockers are in the back. Now one of the things that you'll see in all three of these schemes is the entry and the lobby way are kind of consistent. Uh, we feel like this is a great entry and there'd also be an entry on the campus side up at the top of the hill. So this solves a lot of your accessibility problems where students can come into the lobby area, access elevators, make their way down the building uh, and then out to the front or vice versa. So uh, this particular idea uh, solves uh, several, of your, uh, several of our challenges uh, when it comes to planning. So if we move to option Z, again, another idea, the classrooms, exercise and dance, move back against the hill again uh, with a forefront of outdoor educational space uh, that's programmed into uh, the project itself. So those are three options. You'll see there, these are preliminary concepts. We haven't even worked with the, the user group and stakeholders yet on if any of these concepts are viable, but we do want to really be mindful of the money we can save by keeping the existing gymnasium while we're building the, the rest of the facility or a portion of the facility. So timeline, we're just getting started now, as I mentioned, and the preliminary uh, plans actually started uh, back in uh, July when uh, the district was looking for design professionals such as ourselves. Now that we're on board, we're working full speed ahead. We're working through the programming and planning phase uh, and starting the schematic design along the way. So the first time we'll be able to really have a rough order magnitude of what this might cost is at the end of the year, which will be on programming documents and planning documents uh, that just give us uh, what we think uh, that it might cost based on the square footage of the project and what we know about construction in the area area, what we think um, the contingency, contingency might need to be for design and construction as well as escalation cost uh, to the midpoint of construction. Then in 2020 you can see there is a primarily design phase, so we're working through schematic, design development and construction documents. Uh, and then in 2021 we'll be getting approval from uh, Division of the State Architect, which is DSA. Uh, and then advertising for bid and then ultimately start construction in August of 2021. Uh, then construction going for just over two years and being complete by uh, December 2023. And one of the things you'll notice there in the highlighted is each one of those uh, milestone phases will have a cost estimate to put to our designs and then we'll bring that to the district for approval so they'll, they'll have a chance to tell us, yes, we can move forward with that cost, or no, we need to do something to either supplement it or bring it uh, back down to what we think will be on budget. So until we get there, we won't know if uh, we're below budget, above budget, or right on budget, but our goal is to be on or below budget 
uh, at every single one of those milestones, and we'll talk about that in every meeting we have with the stakeholders. So we'll bring up the cost and explain to them where we are relative to that, and we'll have to make smart decisions at every meeting to get it on budget. So stakeholder engagement is very important in the community college uh, world, something we feel like we're uh, better suited than any other design firm, and we'll collaborate with the stakeholders at every single design phase. And at the beginning, you can see the stakeholders are a little smaller. That's because we're getting started. We're collecting data. Uh, we're starting to work with them. We're doing the programming. Uh, and then once we get approval on the budget and the program, we'll move to schematic design phase where we'll really be tackling a lot of different aspects of the project. We'll still be dealing with the program a little bit and how it moves uh, uh, on the site and if it's on the first floor, the second floor, or the third floor. Uh, and what it looks like, the materials of the inside and the outside. So they'll be heavily engaged in getting their input. Again, we're your instrument for design. Uh, we'll take the input from the stakeholders and <coughs> meld it into a beautiful, functional, efficient uh, building. Then once we get in design development, their involvement will be a little less, but more specific. You know, maybe talking about where uh, a particular piece of casework's going, uh, what kind of uh, drawers or support uh, do they need in the inside of each particular room. Uh, then during construction documents, even more detail where we're working for, with facilities, understanding um, all the uh, design requirements as it relates to toilet fixtures, to light fixtures. We want to make sure we're picking something that you're specifying across all your campuses. And uh, so, uh, it's a collaboration from the beginning to the end. Once construction starts, we want that uh, collaboration to be minimized unless there's something critical that happens, uh, something that's coming from the board, because we don't want to be making changes based on any user input during construction unless absolutely necessary and, and approved by the district. So talked about College of the Desert project a little earlier, and we talked about uh, uh, balancing the cost and the budget. I want to show an example of some success that we've had on two projects. This is a PE replacement project and the most recent one that was uh, completed. And you can see there the original budget was 16.9 million. The schematic design estimate, we were below that budget at 16.1 million. Uh, design development, we uh, came back up, which is normal, at, to 16.9. Uh, but we still work with the construction manager, even though we were on budget, uh, to make it as efficient as possible. So by the time we got to the construction document estimate, we went back down to 15.5. Uh, and then the lowest responsive bidder was 14.7 million. Uh, and then the final construction cost was actually lower than that, 13.8. So there were things that they submitted during construction as alternatives to what we had specified that the district accepted and saved them <coughs> money. A lot of that had to do with the uh, central plant and infrastructure of the campus. Uh, but it shows success in balancing the cost and the budget. <coughs> and then this project, the Coastline Community College, not a physical education uh, building. Uh, but we were very successful with uh, balancing the cost and the budget, working with the construction manager. And you can see here there were zero change orders processed through DSA. Now, I can't promise that for every project, uh, but uh, we were successful here at doing that. And as part of that, we had over $700,000 in construction contingency, and we returned all that money to the district. Uh, and then we also gave them a savings by design check in the amount of $132,900. Uh, and so total savings to the district was nearly $900,000. And you can see it's a beautiful uh, ocean view uh, a building, just like <laughs> our building here. So uh, great results uh, can also be uh, very much on budget. Another thing that maybe you haven't thought about that's common with a building of this size and with such a large space is the revenue that it can generate through fundraisers, through uh, rental spaces, even through TV commercial uh, advertising. So this particular project uh, is one that uh, is utilized that. At the end of the project, I gave the dean of the facility a, a couple of contacts for location scouts. Uh, and then at a board meeting, she ran into me and she's like, oh, you're not gonna believe it, uh, Cadillac's been out on our site all week during Christmas break filming for a Super Bowl commercial. 
Uh, and so many of our projects we see just uh, randomly on TV all the time and we text each other and even our clients are saying, oh yeah, well, I saw our project on an IBM commercial. So you can see here all the different TV shows and commercials our projects are on. So that's something I think is a great opportunity for this project once it's complete to be able to utilize it as a revenue generator because of its location and because hopefully uh, we've done an amazing job and created a, a beautiful uh, building for you. So with that, I want to thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Trustee Haslam. The, the, is this on? Yeah. The, uh, the options, the, the three options uh, where you tear down 50% of the facility and, and then move on to the next half later on, is that going to save us the cost of swing space? Uh, not all swing space, but the real big cost of swing space would be the gymnasium itself, the big box. Uh, that would be uh, expensive to have interim housing to build something on campus, and DSA is very particular about what you can use for interim housing. Like a lot of universities would use tensile structures, things that you can come in and they sort of blow up and it, you can utilize them, but uh, DSA won't approve those. So. Uh, our experience with those is it can be costly to have gymnasium interim housing on your campus. So we want to do everything we can to maintain that gymnasium. Other interim housing costs such as a classroom or even a shower and locker rooms is, is much more achievable and easy to deal with uh, given, given our budget. So you'd leave, you'd leave the gymnasium while building a replacement gymnasium? Y yes. Oh right next to it. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. At what point will you be engaging with the, the stakeholders? Uh, we've uh, uh, already started engaging a little bit. We've had one meeting. Uh, next week we have two meetings. On Friday of next week we have an all-day meeting set up where we're meeting with each of the stakeholders that are operating within the existing uh, physical education building now and we're going to tour their spaces. We're going to hear how they work, what's working well, what needs improvement uh, so that we can take all that in and put it all together and then we'll come back together as a larger group uh, where we have heard everybody and we'll do our best to bring all the best ideas to the forefront to where we address everybody's concerns. And then sometimes we can't always solve everybody's problems, but by collaborating and doing it together, they say, well, yeah, I'm not going to get uh, this extra uh, whatever it is uh, that they had requested. Uh, but I see it's more important for the project uh, that uh, this other feature uh, that also has a cost associated with it gets incorporated. So that's part of the consensus building pro uh, process is just letting everyone hear everyone else's concerns. So we'll meet individually first, then we'll bring them together and let them uh, hear each other, uh, or hear the whole concept as it comes together. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, it looks like you guys are going to do a great job with us, so appreciate you coming out. My question, I know you might not have an answer right now, but something to consider in the design process is climate adaptation, just because this project, part of it would be right at the bottom of the hill and sea level rise is a reality that's coming. So just anything you can do to cope with that in the project would be great. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. A good, uh, good suggestion, of course. Even though it's a beautiful location and place, the, the environment is harsh for buildings and for cars as well. But uh, we have to take that in consideration when you're designing coastal. Uh, that's one of the, the things that you might have noticed on the coastline project, which is right on the coast, is it has a naturally ventilated atrium and it's all built out of cast in place concrete. Uh, and it's actually elevated where the parking, uh, a lot of the parking is on the ground level. Uh, not necessarily for any kind of uh, surge or, or flooding, uh, but it raises up the building so you can take advantage of the views. Uh, so that, that, that'll be all things we consider, the maintenance and operation, uh, durability materials, uh, and then any kind of functional aspects of being that close to the ocean. Trustee Parker. Thank you. Um, I've got two questions for you. First is piggybacking on what Trustee Hasland uh, was asking about, and that is stakeholders. Um, how are how do you incorporate student voices in your stakeholder engagement? 
That's uh, really up to the, the district. Uh, we love working with students on the CSU Student Recreation Centers. Uh, they are really our clients because mm -hmm. they're paying for the building. Right. Uh, I mean, in essence, uh, the students can be considered uh, paying for this through the, you know, their parents' tax dollars. Uh, but we love working with students, and it's amazing the kind of fresh ideas and collaboration they can get out, with, uh, get out of them. So we welcome any opportunity uh, to have student uh, voices uh, heard because it's only going to make the project better. Great. Well, then I would, uh, I would ask um, for our staff to look at ways to make sure that student voices get, uh, are part of these stakeholder groups. And then my second question is about the Division of State Architects. So I, in my experience, it's often been that it, the DSA, which permits school and community college buildings, um, it can be an incredible hang up. And you have about six months allocated here. And I don't know what your experience has been. I'm just wondering if that is optimistic. Um, I'd love your feedback on I the DSA. I actually think that that is uh, going to be m way more than we need. Great. I mentioned the 125 community college projects we've done. We have an in-house entitlements team. All they do is go to DSA just about every day. Uh, just about every day in one of the DSA offices in California, we have an LPA person in there. Uh, and so they really help us navigate that. Uh, uh, some of the forms that DSA uses, we created for them uh, to make it better. So you won't hear a lot of architects say this, but I love uh, DSA. Our, our team <laughs> loves DSA. I've never heard that before. You've never heard it before, <laughs> but, but they really uh, are rigorous about what they uh, do and how they check uh, our work. And uh, so that for us, for us is really helpful. And since we have a dedicated team of educational um, uh, engineers and architects, we're, we know what they want. We know what they're looking for. So a lot of our stuff is coming back uh, way earlier than we even anticipated, especially over the last couple of years, even though they've been, they've been very busy. So instead of waiting four months to get your plan check comments back, they're coming back in 12 weeks. We're like, we don't even know what to do with this. You know, we're surprised that it's here. Uh, we're glad it's here. And it'll come back in sections because we submit uh, three different uh, sets of drawings. Uh, but we're uh, very happy uh, to work with DSA and have relationships with each one of the, the offices, including uh, Los Angeles, of course. Super. That's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Trustee Croninger. Oh, thank you for your presentation and um, enthusiasm. And um, I would add to Kate's question about stakeholders and add the community to that because um, <laughs> Uh, your examples here are dramatic and um, very modern. This is not a dramatic, very modern town. This is a Spanish mission uh, colonial revival town. And I would foresee a significant amount of community controversy if we put a very modern building in that highly visible location as you have pointed out. Right. I mean, this is a really, this is going to be visible to everyone. So um, it's, it may not be apparent to you, but these aesthetic design standards are actually nothing that the board has endorsed. They were presented to us for information only, and they omitted to address one of the key issues we had been talking about for some time, which was a thematic approach to college buildings that would unify um, and basically set an architectural standard. Rather, it came out as whatever you feel like. I think it's important to go back to that concept of uh, thematic and the theme that we were working off of was the original administration building here. So I'm sure it is a challenge, but I would suggest that you look at that admin building, look at um, pa, uh, La Paseo, look at the county courthouse, which is the wow building in this town. Mm -hmm. And um, Mission is probably the simplest version of that. But I think we're really going to get some um, community concern if we take off in a direction that is very different from the ambience of the, of the community as it now stands. So I just wanted to alert you to that. The other thing I would say to uh, reinforce what Trustee Abood brought up, um, climate change, 
Uh, the city has studies on rising ocean levels. I was under the impression that they were indicating we will be literally impacted and perhaps impacted at this site in 30 years. What I've been told more recently is it's 11 years. So I would ask that you look closely at that materials too as you do your planning. Absolutely. And we, we didn't show it, but uh, we have plenty of buildings that are very contextual in the sense that the, they're mission style, Spanish uh, Renaissance revival, things like that. So our work is reflective of uh, your desire uh, in campuses, those particular projects where it happened to be physical education and they just happen to be on modern campuses. And, and so we're very proud of being able to blend in. One of the greatest compliments we got is one of our Finnish photographers went to the site and he said he couldn't find the new building, even though he's standing <laughs> right out in front of it because it blended right in with the rest of the campus context. Yeah, well, we don't have a very blended campus right now, and that was one of the things we were trying to address is to really bring it together. Um, another place to look at is, is our shot uh, campus where we have an original building. Um, as well in those styles. So I think you could maximize the spectacular view from the inside to the outside. You're the architects, you can figure this out, but I'm just concerned that we not take off in a direction that many people in the community might find incongruous with the rest of the town. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. I like your tie, you're very fall. Oh, thank you. But first I want to thank the team at the college who put all this is spearheading this. As you guys know, I have spent over 10 years every week either at a dance studio, a field, or a gym because I have children. And so to see a project like this, even on Friday night, I was at the football game, the big game with, and Santa Barbara High won. Um, and so just as you see the kids going off, and then I was like, oh, the locker room, you know, and just as I was looking at those layouts, I was thinking of just, yeah, the feasibility of folks getting off the field into the locker room and different things like that. So um, I think in terms of community stakeholder input and students, um, I think students, uh, parents, I mean, everybody's really excited about the possibility of this. I know as my son's now in high school sports, safety's become a real issue. So really looking at our gyms and the equipment and just the whole layout and how we're really re-envisioning the athlete experience to prevent injury has, um, is a big focus. And I think that providing this for the students is gonna be a really great experience. When I first got on the board, Dr. Gaskin, remember Jonathan, she did these um, presentations for us. And for some reason, that's the first presentation that I remembered was our student success um, outcomes in athletics and so I always remember that and um, super supportive of this project and I um, I think that the architects that did the California Hotel down on State Street the Funk mm -hmm. Zone I think that that so you know when you drive the the harbor mm -hmm. those they did a good job blending into State Street but yet it's still modern and then Moxie which was um, and I remember I was on the I was on the parent community stakeholder group for that one um, and so even, it's tricky, it's the little children's museum downtown, and so I feel like there's ways that architects have gotten creative in Santa Barbara to make us feel like we're still a small town, but still be innovative with some of the, the possibilities of projects. Um, so I wanna say thank you, and um, I appreciate the XYZ and that we can live in a house while we remodel it, because I think most people in Santa Barbara do that, nobody can afford to just right. outright move out. Um, so I, Lindsay, into the team, I just think that more frequent updates like this, if it's possible, I know with packed agendas, but Dr. Benjamin, if you could keep us, you know, kind of in the loop. And so I was glad to see this so early, because I think that that's been um, where we kind of can't all get on board on something because we kind of feel fragmented about the information. So I feel like this is coming early enough. Um, so thank you for the speed in which you guys have worked on this and um, good luck. Hopefully this all works out. Thank you. Trustee Nelson, do you have any questions or comments? I don't have too many questions. They haven't really done anything yet, but I appreciate your, um, you've started at least, and I appreciate your presentation. And um, kind of a hobby of mine since I was in college and used to go to all the architecture lecture, guest lecturers, mm -hmm. and it was always fun to think outside the box and have different ideas and different, from different perspectives come into play. Um, from, for me as a trustee here, the number one priority is to keep it on budget or under, if you could do that, that's a miracle. Um, number two, it's gotta be, we have to be able to pay for this and if it goes over budget, what are we not gonna be able to spend on student outcomes? So that's very important. The next thing is that the whole design, the functionality needs to be student-centered and having a, and you spoke to that, 
talking about having um, ha having an environment that encourages their participation and creating a space where they want to be. And number three, um, some place, um, something to the building should look like and function as something the community can be proud of. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you're aware of those things. It'll be very interesting to see what you come back with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you, know, you, said that's, you brought up a good point, because God forbid, but our gym, for the natural disasters that our city has unfortunately been prone to, and God forbid, it, we should have to use it at that level, but our gym did become an evacuation site for folks, and so I think that element was yeah. important, where that is a staple of pride that we can do that for the community. Yeah. So Absolutely. Trustee oh, well. I just want to thank you for coming. Um, the gym is home to a lot of students because we use it every day. And right now, it's not in the best shape. But we hope with your help and your knowledge, you can put in the best you can do for us. And we're happy to see what the gym becomes in a few years. So thank you for coming. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flanagan, for uh, your presentation. It was really, uh, uh, I found it exciting. I, I love great architecture, and uh, I saw some great architecture up there. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited about the possibilities of what you can produce. And I tell you, we're really excited about the option you presented about saving us some money on the swing, uh, swing space, because that is a concern of ours, a big concern of ours at the, at the moment. And as you know, that's on us. Um, so uh, we like your thinking in yeah. that regard. Yeah. yeah, any money we can save can go right back into the project to benefit the students. Anybody else before? Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Have a good evening. Well, thank you for the uh, chocolate. <laughs> did, you, did you see the nutritional contents? I'm afraid of how much sugar is in there. Right, there's no 250 plus of sports and recreation, 200 plus higher yeah. ed. Oh, okay. 100% okay, so satisfaction. So we're going to move oh, on to. Uh, I should have read it. Thank you. So we're going to move on to uh, approval of the minutes. We okay. have. You had one more to that goes out of order. Oh, I'm sorry. The sabbatical leave report. Mr. Wise, report yes. of the sab sabbatical outcomes. Sorry about that. Dr. Benjamin, board, audience. Um, I thank you very much for supporting sabbaticals. I, I spent a year and did four major projects uh, which have uh, greatly improved the uh, education here at Santa Barbara City College. Um, the first project that I did was a, a one that was a personal need for me, which was to identify marine algae. Um, it's one of the, I'm a botanist by trade. And so um, one of the interesting things was going down to Ledbetter Beach and, and picking through the drift and watching how people were kind of shocked that this man was going through and curiously muttering about what this was and what that was. But being Santa Barbara, um, we got into the thing, and, and many of the people came by and said, oh, that's really a cool project, and that was kind of fun. I told them I was a, a professor here at City College. I also made a connection with uh, Kathy Ann Miller from UC Berkeley, a uh, wonderful connection with her. She's a, an algologist, and she was able to help me with a lot of the identification of the algae. So that was one of the aspects of the project. I was supposed to collect about 50 specimens, and I collected 187, mostly because I didn't know what they were and then uh, found out what they were, so that was, that was nice. Uh, the second thing that I um, completed was a lab manual for the plant bio class, Bio 101. Uh, this particular project was, uh, was very worthwhile. I've got a lot of positive student uh, feedback from that. Um, Ms. Alexandra Montes de Oca is in the class right now, and so if you need a secondary opinion, I'm sure she can give you one. <coughs> Uh, on the other side of this, when we take a look at some of the lab manuals that are produced commercially, for example, one by McGraw-Hill, it costs the students $110. This lab manual costs the students $15. If you take that over six years, you have collectively saved the students over $114,000. So I do understand that sabbaticals can be expensive. I do understand that in this tight budget, people are looking at 
maybe we can cut back. I think that's a mistake. I think the investment that the board supports, I think the investment that is in the contract effectively is beneficial to students. And, and in the dollar sign, it's, an, it's beneficial. Now, I, I don't want to monetize sabbaticals because I also believe that they have a wonderful professional um, engagement. I have a colleague who has a two-year-old daughter. When he goes home, he doesn't have a lot of time to engage in professional activities to improve his teaching. He's an excellent instructor, but those are some of the issues that he has uh, that are understandable issues, family issues that go along that line. Uh, the third part of my uh, sabbatical was a course at UCSB with um, uh, Claudia Tyler, and it was an environmental ecology class. I think one of the things that I learned somewhat of, of the content, which I needed to update, but was her mastery of teaching. And it was wonderful to sit in amongst a bunch of UC students. One called me, hey, bro, and that was very nice. Um, I kind of, um, it was charming. Um, anyway, but her, her techniques were, I think, very inspirational. And it kind of shifted my course of, of thinking and, and how I, I present stuff. So to be able to watch a master teacher like, like Claudia Tyler was, was very good. And, and I gained a lot of information that way. Uh, lastly was the presentation of a human evolution course, uh, which we uh, are developing in the biological science uh, program. Uh, I did contact a professor at uh, Northridge, but sh two or three times she did not respond. Uh, I did make some connections with um, uh, Alfredo Koch up at Allen Hancock College, and he brought another colleague from Bordeaux, France. Her name was Georgia Lytra, uh, and they were involved in viticulture and enology, winemaking. Um, and she invited me to Bordeaux, and I thought, that's not a bad idea. So I spent some time in Bordeaux. Without having uh, the contact with this gal from Northridge, I was able to go out and see several of the Neanderthal sites. I uh, visited a number of museums, Musée d'Aquitaine, saw Lascaux IV, saw Cavett uh, Ruffignac, and went to the museum in Toulouse. Gained a phenomenal amount of information. Got to see original pieces in anthropology, which were phenomenal. So I thank the board very much for the support that you have given sabbaticals. I think they're a wonderful opportunity, and I would be here to entertain any questions that you may have. No, I mean, I just think it's great that, I mean, biology is such a core subject and not just for bio and STEM majors, but it's just a subject for IGETC and the CSU breadth for students to transfer, as well as our dual enrollment students that need a lab. And so I think it's great that you took the time to really beef up something that's gonna be so beneficial to all populations of students, because it's part of a G breadth transfer already. So thank you. And thank plus you. we're a coastal town, so this is important. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay. All right. Oh, we got one more. Just a, a comment. I. I want to support your idea that sabbaticals for faculty are, are wonderful opportunities. Uh, there's also the fiscal reality that we face. And so out of these two concepts, I'm, I'm searching for a way of continuing sabbaticals while reducing the actual cost of the college. And I, I think brighter minds than mine are going to have to come up with some some way of generating a revenue neutral or close to revenue neutral process by which we continue this very valuable part of what a faculty member needs for purposes of simple reflection. Uh, of, and, that, and that's something that faculty do not have a lot of time for during the working day. And, and that reflection gets transformed into uh, improved instruction, improved uh, syllabi, and, uh, and good stuff for, for students. But we do have a problem, and it's not going away. So thanks. Trustee Nelson. Peter, you stole my thunder, but so I fully support what you just said. Um, I guess I'd like to add that, you know, in an ideal world, we would have enough money to do everything we want to do that everybody wants, but that such is not the case. Um, things may get better, and they will eventually, and then they'll probably get worse again because that's the nature of things. Um, so then it becomes like a trade-off. And so if we're going to continue to uphold our, and this board really pushed and 
got the sabbaticals going again, and, and we're really very, very supportive. Um, the reports that we've heard back have been encouraging to us. Yours was very encouraging. And um, so if you, if you, in your musings and relationships with others, if you get some ideas, any input at all would be appreciated to us, and you know how to get it in front of us or funnel it to us. Um, doesn't have to be formal. We're just looking for ways and just not, and just sometimes we have to make decisions, this or that. So any help at all, any musings you have or things you think of, we'd appreciate the feedback. And then um, as an aside, um, I reread a book I hadn't read for a number of years. There was this botanist that was an astronaut and he got stranded on Mars by himself. And I don't know if you've read that. But he grew I saw potatoes, and he's, yeah, like, well, the book's much better, a okay. lot more science. And um, anyway, uh, so the whole world can relate to what you do in some way or another. The net effect is, the net impression is, is you're a very capable person, even if it's not you personally, the, what you do says you can do anything. And as, as being well-rounded, up-to-date and experience helps you do a better job in front of those students and that's what we're all about service to our community thank you thank you very much thank you as as I think Trustee Nielsen indicated we we um, we can't fund sabbaticals to Mars but we, <laughs> <laughs> we would like to see them uh, continue but we do, we do face uh, we do face financial uh, fiscal challenges at the moment so. I, I do think that's why I brought up the point that I, I don't know how much it costs the board the, the district f to fund a sabbatical I know that we contribute some of our um, overload to help with the sabbatical material I think that um, one of the things that I wanted to really emphasize on certain sabbaticals is that um, the investment that you make in students. For example, I gave that figure of $114,000. That's a huge collective savings for our students. So they are paying about a tenth for this le uh, book that was developed. And yes, it, it's an investment on your part, but it also reaps the benefit for the local students phenomenally. So that's why I brought that up. But again, I, I hate to monetize sabbaticals because there's so much more valuable than that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so I believe now we can move on to approval of the minutes for the uh, last three meetings. Um, before we get to a motion, I believe Maybe Trustee Croninger had some corrections that had been provided. There were just a couple of typos, I think. Um, Angie can fix them, but nothing that know, we need. To nothing major. Okay. It was it was you know minor mix-ups. So do we hear a motion for approval. Move approval. Is there a second? No. Okay. Trustee yes. Nielsen. Are we, comments. Are we talking about the um, approval of the uh, minutes? Yeah. On the third item, under that, it, there, was, um, there was no description at the very top of the page of what the first motion was, only that it was approved. And so I had to read it. And I only bring this up because I figured it out. It's not that hard to figure out. But if someone was, were to read that for the first time, I don't think they'd know what, what we were doing. Yeah, I, that was one of the corrections she asked. It was, oh, oh, that, okay, well, I wasn't aware of. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. Then I would then I would second the motion to uh, approve. Marsha okay. seconded. Any other discussion? <laughs> Done. Done. Hearing no other discussion, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Hearing none, the motion passes. <coughs> so we'll now move to reports. First report from uh, Academic Senate, Patricia Stark. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, we're all so very busy, and your agenda is so very long. <laughs> <laughs> 
today, um, but I still think it's important that we stay on more than nodding terms with each other. And um, because we are so very busy doing so many things, I, str I struggled a little bit about what to talk to you about today. And I decided rather than zeroing in to take sort of a big picture look at um, faculty involvement. And what better to frame it with than accreditation? As you know, we are engaged in a self-study in accreditation, and I am a faculty lead on standard four, which is governance. Um, so here is the standard, at the beginning of the standard, and you can see I highlighted key terms. Um, we have to focus on government um, leader contributions of leadership, governance roles defined in policy designed to facilitate decisions. We should have established governance structures, processes, and practices, and of course it mentions all of us, the governing board, the administrator, the faculty, staff, and the students working together for the good of the institution. Um, you guys are <laughs> standard 4C. Um, our chief executive officer is standard 4B, and everybody else in this room is standard 4A, and that is our decision-making roles and processes. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, because faculty is deeply involved on a very high and a very detailed level in these processes. Um, and I'm going to try to make this interesting. <laughs> Talking about committees and organization can be a little dry, but it really goes straight to the heart of how we keep the academy vital and real and relevant. Um, first, we have our Senate, of which I am president. Um, the Senate has its committees where we do the detailed work, including um, we um, read all of the proposals for sabbaticals. <laughs> I was actually trying to dig through the contract to see how much we spend on sabbaticals to answer your question, and I had to get up here and do this. Um, but we have more proposals for sabbaticals than we have available funding, so our Senate committee reads through all of them. They rank them. They do the magic required to make sure the math adds up. Um, a lot of the people I were going to mention have already left, but our curriculum committee, Kathy O'Connor was here for a little while. You have on your agenda today the new courses, the new proposals. Those are all part of the faculty work on our Senate committees. It's also important to note that um, we have college-wide committees, and I think the role of our college-wide committees is actually becoming more transparent and elevated um, under the tenure of our new um, EVP and our new superintendent president. And um, the academic senate president and the senate appoints all the faculty members to those committees. So I want to talk just a minute about how that works. Um, first of all, this is the structure of our Senate. We have one senator who represents our adjunct faculty in the credit side of our institution, one senator representing non-credit, part-time faculty. Um, we have 11 academic divisions, and those divisions with 26 or more instructors get two senators. And then we have a host of Senate liaisons who spread out across campus, attending many meetings, participating in meetings, collecting that information, and starting this information communication loop so that the, all of our employees know what is going on in the college and how they can get involved. Um, here are our committees. Um, each of our committees has a faculty chair. The chairs coordinate with the Senate. We give them work to do. We give them detailed tasks to do. They do the work. They come back to us with recommendations, um, the way that most committee structures work. They create agendas. They keep minutes. They write annual reports with recommendations for future consideration. Um, it's important to note, because a huge standard throughout, uh, uh, one of the um, one of the questions for which we need to present evidence um, that we meet the standard has to do with communication. How do we communicate our shared decision making throughout the academy? And um, I do control a, a chunk of this. And we were informed, I think I may have told you guys this before, that all of our Senate committees really should be Brown Act committees. So um, we, the, all of our Senate committees are now open to the public. They um, provide an opportunity for public comment. Um, I was working with Angie today. We're going to get all of our committee chairs trained in our new board doc tool. And all of those agendas will be posted and transparent for public participation. 72 hours before the start of the meeting. <laughs> As I'm sure you know, Dr. Benjamin and Angie know well. 
Um, so, as I was saying, one of the things that's, that we've done is um, we have created these cross-constituency committees that really are grappling with some of the most significant issues that are happening on campus. And um, all, all of the ones I'm showing here, the Student Equity and Achievement Committee, the, um, the Strategic Enrollment Management Committee, the Student Equity Committee, they're all cross constituencies. So we'll have members for our classified consultation group, members from our associated student government, the Advancing Leadership Association, and the faculty. Um, enrollment, str strategic enrollment management is one. You have a report today about fall enrollment. Um, we're going to be taking a global look at that to see what we can do in every way possible to foster a strategic plan to increase our productivity. Um, the Student Equity Committee, you've seen a report of the Student Equity Plan that we presented. Um, and the categorical funding is being, is grouped under the Student Equity and Achievement Committee. All right. What are our goals with all of this? Um, we want to present a diverse, informed faculty voice to all college decisions, and we want to take lead on those 10 plus 1 issues that are under the Senate's primacy. Um, I think under a new awareness of bringing voices to the table that have not traditionally been there, before we appoint to any committee, um, I do a campus-wide outreach and in to, every, to try to encourage anyone who's interested. And if that doesn't yield enough faculty participants, then I do targeted outreach to those areas, um, to those faculty who may have content expertise. I should add that um, the Academic Senate President also appoints to hiring committees. You're going to hear a report in a little while on our efforts to hire a new superintendent president. So we have put faculty on that committee as well. Um, it is our goal to work collegially with all of our other constituency groups, as they listed here, including with our senior administration. Um, we also have but some ad hoc committees that are developing this semester. Um, the, we just met yesterday on this one. This is a College Planning Council Budget Deficit Reduction. I made up that name for it, Dr. Benjamin. I know you have another name. Um, and this is, Dr. Benjamin is asking us to meet as a, all of the constituency groups to rate a long list of um, suggestions that were turned in by college employees so we can see which ones are actually viable, long-term, short-term, negotiated items, et cetera. Complaint committee, all last spring you heard com comments and concerns from students who felt that their voices were not being heard, that complaints are not being adequately dealt with. We have an ad hoc committee concerning that. And then finally, um, something I've talked to you about, and that is how are we going to start moving things out of our administrative procedures into our collective bargaining agreement for negotiations. Um, we use the same loop. One of the things we're working very hard on in terms of communication is all our Senate committees have a public website. Um, they, of course, are linked to the SBCC website. Those sites should include the charge of the committee, what, the work, what their work is, the names of all the members, and the links to the agendas in the meetings. We are not consistent college-wide on this. It's an accreditation standard. We've identified gaps, and we're working on it. Um, so finally, what's the point of all of this shared governance, shared decision making, um, thinking about how it all fits together, the day-to-day -day work of doing it? Um, it's the minimum that we can do to foster the shared communication and the feedback loop to involve faculty in all of the important decisions being made. Um, we like to believe that what we're doing at the faculty level can become a model college-wide for communication and transparency. But actually, but at the, in the final analysis, successful communication is really going to depend on whether the employees at the college are actually reading and engaging and re responding to the information that we're providing. So we're trying to make our information is clear and as transparent as possible so we can do everything to optimize that shared governance and shared decision making. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Uh, next report from uh, Alexandra Montes de Oca, Associated Students. Hello, everyone. 
Hello. <laughs> All right. Uh, how's everyone doing? Good, Good evening. Good Welcome. Evening. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, I believe the last time we met, it was quite a while ago. Um, our board is now a full board. We have about 10 members, including myself. I'm very excited for all of our board members. Um, they're all great students and they're all very active in each of the roles that they're doing. So I'm very happy about that. Um, some of the big item topics that we're doing right now, um, the biggest one is we're collaborating with a um, group called Free SB. Um, it is co-founded by uh, Tom Steele. He is a UCSB graduate who is working on a policy that uses uh, cannabis tax revenue to p possibly build a grant to address um, student homelessness and hunger. Um, so we're pairing up with him and um, we're gonna be attending a town hall meeting tomorrow afternoon. Um, both me and a few of our other officers are gonna be present to represent SBCC. Um, and part of tackling this issue of student hunger and homelessness. Um, so that's gonna be tomorrow and in the evening. Um, hopefully get to meet um, Congressman uh, Carbajal as well as other legislators as well. So that'll be very exciting. Um, other topics that we are working on right now. Um, I'm currently working on a little bit of marketing for ASG, so the ASG website, I'm vamping that up. So it's accessible to all that want to know a little bit more about ASG and what they're doing. Uh, do, 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 just a couple other things. Um, getting a lot of feedback from a lot of students um, about student emails that we're sending out as well, both good and bad, and so we have been addressing those as well. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, ASG is in support of um, undocumented, student, undocumented Student Week of Action, which is gonna be happening next week. Um, so uh, ASU was able to support one of the speaker events um, that is happening, so we're very excited for that. Um, also supporting the Leonardo Durantes lecture series um, and other um, events that are, you know, clubs that want to come and need support, we are supporting them as well. Um, we're trying to really bridge the gap so a lot of students are aware of what ASU is and what they're doing. Um, so one of the things that we're going to try to do is do like classroom announcements and things like that. So. You know, small little things just to bridge gaps. Um, and then other things that we are going to be working on in the future, um, one of our students on, on our board, um, our student um, advocate, he mentioned that um, he knows there's a gap between professors, administrators, and the students. Um, so we are trying to brainstorm ways in which we could tackle that uh, gap that may exist between um, <laughs> professors and administrators as well. Um, so that's kind of like what the up to date and what we're up to. <laughs> Thank you. Sounds like you're up to a lot. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions? I just have a question. Thank you, Alexandra. Can you elaborate a little bit more? What are you guys doing with the gentleman with the cannabis? How are you guys partnering with him? Yes. Yeah, so it's more of an advocacy group at the moment. He is creating a policy that he hopes to bring up to the county legislators and the county people of Santa Barbara. Um, what it is, it's possibly allocating some money since. Uh, Santa Barbara is Santa Barbara and there's a lot of cannabis around. Um, there's a lot of tax that's coming from that. He's hoping to allocate that tax to create it into his own grant or a, possibly a grant that will be able to address this uh, issue of homelessness um, and hunger. Um, so what we are doing is I've met with another student as well um, who, his name is Brandon, he is the um, uh, founder of the club Free, F-R-E-E. -E. Um, and he knows a lot about the logistics of money and things like that. So his collaboration could possibly help very well with how that's actually going to happen uh, monetary wise, how that grant's going to come about, how that's a grant is going to affect the students, how they are allowed to access that as well. Um, but it's right now it's, it's policy work. It's all advocacy at the moment. We're just trying to build a lot of uh, knowledge that this is something we are trying to work on. Um, so that's what that is a little bit. Okay. But. Yeah. No, it sounds great that you guys are involved in different things. My first thought was, it who, this, in, in partnering with your advisor and just who you, the students partner with. And what I thought about was, you know, I teach kindergarten, mm -hmm. and so uh, a cannabis group in town years ago. You might remember this because you were on the board at Taylor Unified. Uh, they wanted to contribute to our gardening program, mm -hmm. and so good enough, the adults decided that that probably was not the best partnership while yeah. that industry had some very um, 
interesting goals, mm -hmm. but partnering with the cannabis um, industry probably would not have been the best thing for school age children in the garden. Right. And so I guess that made me think of um, marijuana as a gateway to other drugs mm -hmm. and just the plethora of work that is out there yeah. and now the research that we have from doctors because of the advanced technology with looking at brain scans and imaging and mm -hmm. looking at the young brain that's not fully developed till age 25 yeah. and what that's happening. So that just made me think about that, but I'm sure you guys are working with your advisors and working strategically as to who you're partnering with and mm -hmm. what you put the SBCC student stamp on to make mm -hmm. sure that it it's supportive of all initiatives. So anyway, but yeah, good job. Of course, thank you. Not saying any other hands. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next report from uh, our 30 year employee, Liz Oshinklaus. Good afternoon. Who was, who was uh, president when you started? Peter McDougall. No, no, President of the United States. I always think of things like President of the United States? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember. Okay. <laughs> I, I think of the President of the college. <laughs> There's been actually several since. It was, President, it was Ronald Reagan, I was think, it? just to show how long ago that was. <laughs> uh, uh, the classified staff is also working on the budget reduction. We are trying to get as much input from the staff as possible, so after we got the list, uh, from CPC, we sent out a survey to all the classified staff, and so we got a lot of good input so we could bring back to CPC, and we're still working on the committee for the reductions. Today, though, the most important thing I'm asking you to do is to ratify our contract. We worked over a year on the contract, and I want to thank the district team, Lindsay Moss, uh, Melissa Moreno, Michael Modell, and Marcy. Wade, and we use the interface approach, which I think worked better this time than has some in the past. I really want to thank Lindsay. She kind of stepped in at a time uh, when we were kind of moving slowly, weren't making a lot of progress. Meetings were very far apart. So I want to thank her for kind of getting us back on track and getting us things done. After she started with us, almost every meeting, we would get tentative agreements. And now we're presenting you with a contract that um, I hope you will ratify for us. And then after that, with uh, Marcy's influence, we're going to HR sponsoring meetings to train the different managers on the contract, which has never happened before. Some of the managers may not even be aware of any of the contents or a few of the contents, and this time we're going to actually have some training sessions with the, uh, the, with the managers and maybe some of the staff later, but the ones with the managers have already been scheduled, so they will be. Liz, you're, as long you're, as you trailing, ratify, you're trailing off. And, as long uh, as you ratify. Great, uh, thank you. We will be able to proceed with those meetings, so uh, thank you very much. Any questions? I just think it's great that the, the training aspect of it, um, this becomes contract law, and so, uh, it's important for the administrators to know the contract as well as the employees. It um, is. And so many folks in that work with contracts, um, and I say we because I'm a teacher too, and you, te you know, everybody's, uh, sometimes it's, people don't want to know and you're just doing your thing, but it's so important because it is the law of the conditions and, and the environments that we work in. So I think that that training is so important. And uh, so thank you that you guys are going to, help with that. I think Marcy too first. Yeah. It was her idea. We haven't done this in the past. Yeah. Well, Marcy. And it's very important because the more people understand the rules mm -hmm. we live by, then the easier it is to get mm -hmm. along with everybody. Absolutely. And not have conflicts. So that's good. House of order is what we want. Thank yeah. you, Marcy. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. And I think next from oh, yes. Good evening. our president. I, I'll be brief. I want to start by congratulating both uh, Liz and Arturo and their service to the. Is it not on? No, it it got to be up. It was really on. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I finally got it right, and then I'm told it's wrong. <laughs> Okay, uh, first I want to start by congratulating both Liz and Arturo for their many years of service. And 
you would think, well, sometimes people slow down when they worked in a place a long time. That's true for neither of them. So I really appreciate their dedication. Um, we have, as you know, the team, the cabinet probably spends now, since we're in this budget uh, discussion mode, about seven hours a week in meetings, and most of that time is spent talking about the budget. And it's not just a cabinet issue, it's an, a college issue. And so uh, we've taken it to CPC, and as you've heard the two constituency leaders say, anyway, they are working in, in a cross-constituency man manner to come up with 10 recommendations. And they came up with this fabulous idea, I think, of working together on it. The list will be presented in the board to you next month in your packet and we'll go through. And they are approaching it in a very serious way, what's realistic, what's not, and working as a team on it. And I really appreciate the, the way they responded to that request. As you know, we've been involved in um, working on our diversity, equity, and inclusion survey. We had our uh, various forums focus groups last week. We're moving forward uh, and trying to respond to it. It's very important to people. People took their time to participate. You had a presentation last month. We had 25 different focus groups last week. And the facilitators who worked on that are now writing the report. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm thinking we'll get the report next week. In the meantime, there's still a lot to do in regard to that. And so I'll be talking to CPC about it next week, about the, what the next steps are that we'll take. As a result of that, we're working on a, a complaint procedure, um, which was mentioned by Patricia Stark, and uh, Lori Vasquez is chairing that group, and it is really an amazing group, not the usual suspects, and there are people who are very, very interested in this project. They are doing all kinds of research. I get copied on the email. so. <laughs> I think they are going to come up with a really, really good process uh, with which uh, employees will be pretty satisfied. So I want to just thank them in advance. They were given one month. They asked for a four-day extension. So uh, we're looking forward. And of course, it was granted. <laughs> and we're looking forward to the, to the results of their work. And finally, I've told you before that HR is moving to another location and that the uh, student services building will be used only for student services. Well, that move for HR will take place at the end of this month. Uh -huh. I'm sure they are going to have an open house to which, <laughs> to which you will be invited. <laughs> she invited invite us to the pre-open house to help you move the boxes. <laughs> So that concludes my oh, report. Okay. Thank you very much. So we next move to the um, consent um, agenda, which includes items 7.1 <laughs> through 7.4, 8.1 through 8.5, and 9.1 through 9.6. Are there any requests to remove any items from the consent agenda? Just 8.1. 8.1. Okay. Any any others? Um, I I just had a, a quick comment that would 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 just I just need to say this in. In the 7.3, we have uh, professional volunteers, and and they're they're 21 people who are volunteering their time to work <laughs> with our students and with faculty. And I just think we need to take a moment to say thank you to to such people. I mean, I'll I second don't, that. I don't need to take it off the <laughs> agenda. I just need to say that. Okay. <laughs> I think it was important that you said that. Um, so we have a request to remove 8.1 before we get to that. And any, if there are no others, do I hear a motion to approve the consent, ag consent agenda uh, except for item 8.1? So moved. Is there a second? Second. 
Any discussion? I All just, those. I just have a question on the. Um, and I had, I got the question today and I, I emailed, but I know I didn't get a response. For all the, the movement that we're doing at the college and, and I know I understand from a high level, but for the, um, Dr. Benjamin, how would we answer the question for the, the folks that are being reclassified and you know, the, we're moving positions around and, and this is all done under the big umbrella of the budget. Um, Gosh, the permanent personnel, is that what it, I think it's on there? The, the folks, reclassification. yeah, that. And so how would, we, how do we answer the perception that we would, that we are, you know, building up a bubble of an employee group here and we're supposed to be cutting? We're not building up a bubble of an employee group. We're giving people what they deserve. Uh, we had set aside budget for this and this was like $4,000, a little over $4,000 over and what we had budgeted. This is how you get into trouble with having people work out of class and years and years later they worked and it's not fair to the employees. We have this process, we should follow it so that people are appropriately compensated for what they do. That's the whole idea behind it. That's perfect. So I, I feel totally justified in having this on. Perfect, yeah. So do I understand. Yeah, I appreciate you commenting that. I got some questions on it, and I feel like you've kept the board abreast in terms of the movement and what we're doing, especially we've gone through literally a fine comb with the budget, and so I think that that makes sense. You recall in another agenda, maybe a couple of months ago, we had, to, we had an employee who had been working out of class for years, and it's, we had mm -hmm. to make that right, and so we don't want to get behind on that again. Mm -hmm. It's a morale, morale buster. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. No, thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments before we vote on the consent agenda? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. So now we'll move <coughs> to the item removed, 8.1. 8 and uh, I guess we'll start with comments from Trustee Gallardo. Yeah, well, I want to thank um, Z. I spoke with him, and he went through detail, and it was very helpful. And so I understand the, the background with the Chancellor's Office and the complexity with putting all of this together. Um, I, I do want to commend the folks for putting this together. I'm certainly, I got to spend time in Sacramento with the folks working on the ally groups. I think that anytime you're looking at best practices, whether you're looking at disproportionate impact for groups, you're just going to elevate teaching and learning all around because if you improve a system for one group, it's going to be better for all. Um, my reason for pulling it today is some of the activities that are on there and and while everything's still a work in progress, I can't give it my vote, and only because I just have not found the research to be able to justify some of these things. And I have looked high, wide, low, up and down, um, and, and, and I've researched nonprofits that are solely dedicated to social justice and equity gaps in California and looking at our legislation. Um, so while I understand this is all still a work in progress, um, I think it's a great plan with some of the activities around there that's going to elevate the overall teaching and learning experience for students. Um, but because of the lack of research that I don't feel that I can answer that, it, to the public, I'm going to vote no on it, okay. and that's why I pulled it. Is there a motion to uh, uh, pass item 8.1? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, so any other are comment? We in, are we in discussion, or is that what right you're doing? Right now, yes. Do you have a comment? <laughs> um, I have a concern that, first off, we really didn't have a chance to discuss this, and I that was no one's fault. We just had more to do that. Um, then we could fit into the time. Um, and it's a really important plan, and I, like Veronica, I commend all the people who worked really hard on it and um, have put a lot of effort into bringing this to us. Um, my concern is that for me, as I read it, um, I want it to be number one, database, and number two, that the text to me feels insufficiently inclusive. It feels like we have focused on certain issues and not all issues, and certain students and not all students. And so um, the one comment I made in our last meeting was, could we define equity? Um, I did not see that come through this time around. Uh, and in trying to, to capture what I was thinking about that, 
I took the paragraph on equity imper imperative, which is the one that seems closest to talking about what is equity, and is early on, and rephrased it the way I think is more inclusive. So I wanted to put that forward. Um, I said, equity in education means achieving fairness and eliminating equity gaps. Equity means focusing the college on the pedagogical and support strategies that help each of our students succeed in their educational goals, regardless of their personal characteristics, cultural background, or circumstances. Group equity gaps addressed here include race, LGBT, sexual orientation, disability, veterans, foster care, and economically disadvantaged. But there are many other barriers to success, including age, ethnicity, personal health, family, and social trauma, language, former incarceration, homelessness, and more. We teach students not groups, and equity asks us to see them fairly, without bias, as individuals, and provide each student the attention opportunity and resources that person needs to succeed. So that's a broader sense, I think, than we have conveyed here, and, and my suggestion is that we speak along those lines, um, that we recognize we have all manner of types of students that we want to help individually and collectively with their success. Any other comments? Would it be maybe useful to, I mean, I like the paragraph, and maybe we should send that back to the folks who actually put these words together for their consent so that they don't feel dismissed or replaced. I, I suspect they would appreciate the feedback. I be happy to do that. I mean, I, I know there's a deadline issue, and I appreciate that. I'm just hopeful that we could broaden our, our scope of what we're doing here. Well, we need to set, the deadline for this in Sacramento is the 15th. The board can do whatever it, it wants, but my recommendation. I, I, I like what you said, because the committee, it involves a whole college, mm -hmm. and you can change it if you want to tonight, but it will create a real problem for us with the constituents because they and we didn't have time for the feedback we still have to work on this we still have work to do and I would like the opportunity to take your statement back to the group this can be incorporated into the document but we need an approval on this tonight if you don't mind but if you want to put it in here now we'll do whatever you want but I suggest that we give the college an opportunity to respond to that recommendation I'm, of the definition, because I'm, it's something we need to do as a college. And that was one of the things the consultant uh, recommended as well, that we come up with our definition. Can, can we do that and meet the deadline? We, we, we do not have time. Patricia Stark indicated that we are working. We, there's no way we could get all the people together. This needs to be in Sacramento by the 15th today. Could we then vote on this today and assume that this particular paragraph will be taken back to those who put this together in the first place. Absolutely. And at their discretion, they will simply replace one paragraph with another. I don't think we can do it by the 15th is what I'm saying. We have to have this in Sacramento by the 15th. Okay. Are you talking about like maybe like they would amend the plan at some later date type of thing? We have to develop an implementation plan uh, based on what we have here, the development of that plan, and you'll get to see the plan, could include a rewrite or re a review of this statement. Of, well, the inclusion of a definition of equity, which is different, I think, from the definition of equity imperative. Yeah, what, what I was trying to... what equi equity means to the college. Right. I, I think it needs both. But what I was trying to do was take the, the concept of the plan and make it as broad as possible, recognizing that we have a format here, we have certain things the chancellor's office has given us. I think that doesn't change that. But our thinking about what we are doing, 
I think needs to be broader, and that's what I was trying to express. And, and the first level plan seems like the place you would put that because then the implementation flows from that. I, um, I stand to do whatever you want. Yeah. I'll just sit here and listen. So. That was my recommendation. I mean, I guess the question becomes, along Peter's lines, could we, when we do more, st we send more stuff to Sacramento, right? I'm sorry. Do we send more thing, more, not this just is this what plan? Gets approved and goes to them. I don't think they get the implementation plan. They don't. No. No. Oh. Because I was trying to think if we updated the whole thing no. together, that would work. No. About the only thing I know for sure, for absolute sure is that sitting here and trying to write a document by committee uh, is probably not advisable. It is not. I'm trying to find a way out of that. So, uh, but if I'm understanding this correctly, we need to pass this measure tonight. Mm -hmm. We need to pass something tonight. Yeah. That yeah. we need to submit by the 15th. We've already mm -hmm. missed two deadlines. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think this, this is, is, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No. Trustee Nelson. Thank you. Boy, we had a lot of stuff to read for this meeting, so. Um, a couple days ago when I was reading page nine here, where it talks about um, institutional racism, like, and there was some other thing in here that I made a mental note of to say something about. Um, I don't know, I, I didn't, it bothered me. Uh, I didn't like the tone of it. In saying that we have institutional racism, racism is everywhere. And I, I, really, I really disagree with making that a major point in this. And if that's not removed, then I'm, not about, then I'm gonna vote no. Um, I don't think we need to go down that road. I think what we're doing here is we're creating groups of people and highlighting differences by doing the kind of thing that Marsh is talking about, by keeping it broad and the emphasis on recognizing everybody as an individual and to make sure everybody's treated equal is the fair way to do this. I think it's, uh, it's the only fair way. By creating and, hi and highlighting the differences and leaving out a whole bunch of other groups. Um, I like Marsh's example. I wish I'd heard that before. Um, I, I won't support this as it is. Okay. I won't put my name on it. Trustee Abood. I apologize if I can't form the most coherent sentence. I'm a little sick. But uh, I think the point of equity is to help certain people who need it the most, not to help everybody uniformly. And so I think the equity impar imperative paragraph that was been through the process, that has been compiled by everybody is excellent. And I think structural racism is the only way we're going to achieve equity. Oh, eliminating structural racism is the only way we're going to achieve equity. So I think it needs to be a major part of this plan as something we're focused on eliminating. So I'm comfortable with the plan as it is. And thank you for everyone who put it together. Thank you I, for commenting, Tristan, because I think you just proved that there's so many definitions to equity. In K-12, even a school as high performing as Cold Springs finds a disproportionate impact within all their students, even Montecito Union. And so I think that you just highlighted that this definition of equity is, um, it's different. And so in, at least in K-12, even the most affluent, high-performing district is going to have some disproportionate impact, whether maybe it's a mental health issue. Uh, we know that students suffer from all sorts of things. And so I think that's a complexity. So thank you for your comment, because I think that that adds the diversity in the thinking here. Yeah. I think Trustee Croninger uh, had some uh, interesting comments on the one paragraph, but I, I, I don't think now is the time to try to rewrite the paragraph, and I, I support passing it uh, as it is. We face a deadline, and I think it's important that we pass this tonight. Trustee Parker. I'd agree with that. I do really like um, Trustee Croninger's paragraph. Um, my concern with it, even in this document, is that um, we're, we're essentially following the state's metrics around certain specific groups that are state mandated. Um, and so I think in some ways we can do more here at the college level and, and even in the implementation plan, if it is site-based, that is probably the most uh, more important place for that to be. This is a document that is addressing state requirements. 
Um, and it associated is not. Associated with how much money do we get for this? 4.2 4 million dollars. Yeah. So it's, it's not um, as holistic as I think that this group would like it to be. Um, but that's the nature of uh, this, um, the state. <laughs> but so. Kate, the state doesn't mandate what populations to focus on. So I think that's what Marsha, so that's unique there to your local context. So Santa Barbara chose to do X, which is based on the data from the chancellor's office. Right. Yeah. It's not. Uh, Dr. Uh, I would just add that um, Jonathan, comment also highlights for me the, the, the need for that broader uh, look at it because w we have disabled people. They are not of one race. Uh, we have veterans. We have foster kids. Uh, we have economically disadvantaged kids. Um, those are all part of these state populations that we're addressing. And so talking about it in racial terms isn't necessarily reaching all of those students. And I'm trying to get to the broader level. I'm not trying to say we shouldn't address the, those issues. Of course we should. But this is a broad group. And I think Veronica made the comment earlier that when we make improvements for some of them, we make improvements for all of them. Uh, I think all of us read the recent article on the uh, things that Pasadena Community College has done. And um, just as simple as allowing students to uh, ask to get an extension, as you just gave, <laughs> an extension on submitting their um, work when they had a good reason. And teachers had not been allowing that as a matter of routine. And suddenly they realized this was not the best way to go. And this was something that helped all students. Um, so I'm hoping when we implement, we're thinking about the kinds of things that Pasadena did. Because I think what happens in the classroom is so important. And, and details like that are not just details. They're yeah. pass fail. I would agree that what Pasadena has done was very interesting and found some, found some uh, techniques and improvements that maybe we haven't uh, thought of before. Trustee Beshi, do you have any comments for us or? Um, yes, or I do. an advisory vote before we vote? <laughs> I think the plan is well written and it has gone through all groups on campus and these are the people who are here and they've used all the da data they could get from the school and from past years and they've based all of this information they're giving back to us based on those data. But I, I, I agree with what Marsha is saying, but I think that would be in the implementation level, but for the plan they could only base that on all of this data they've given us. So I think I would gladly accept this plan. Okay. Any other comments before we vote? Okay. Is it is it feasible to, I mean, we, we're up against a deadline that's, that's passed this. Can we amend it? You can do whatever you want. Oh, no, I meant later on. We, yes, if, for our internal purposes, but whatever we send to the state will be what's approved by them. Oh, okay. Could we send them another amended copy? If we, I mean, whether they ask for it or not. <laughs> I've already asked for an extension. It no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> you send them this one, and then later on you say, by the yeah. way, we've amended it. Here's, a, here's our most recent version. <laughs> you can't do that with I the paper in school. I don't want to answer that because I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't want to give you a, I don't want to answer because I just really do not know. Okay. Any other <laughs> comments before we vote? They might. The goal, the district is moving, or the state's moving towards continuous improvement, not, you know. <laughs> so they I might, Marsha. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, no, I, I know. I really don't know the answer, and I, I can't even guess. Yeah. yeah. Because they have kind of bent over backward for us already. We don't want to guess with, what, $4.2 <laughs> million? Dollars. Okay. Well, we'll send them seven chocolates in the thing. <laughs> so all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? No. No. So... Trustee Croninger, Gallardo, and Nielsen, no? Okay. Motion passes. But I would still like to take that extra step. Send uh, Marsha's paragraph, which I really like, back to the group that put this together. If they like it or if they want to uh, change it, I think it would be good to hear. 
And then whether the state agrees to receive or not, let's send them a revised copy. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yes, exactly. Why not? It's postage. That's I mean, this all. is going to be a dynamic <laughs> project. It should be dynamic. It, uh, the thing I don't want to do is change something that a whole lot of people have put a whole lot of work into and have come to closure on. And the other thing I don't want to do is hold us up. But the, the third, there is another option, and that is to send that paragraph back, have them, have them work on it, maybe come up with the additional things they want to change, and then send that to, to well, Sacramento. My, my question is, you know, we didn't get enough time to really consider this and have any, any meaningful discussion on it until all of a sudden now there's a deadline. Now we have the time. And, and, we can't, and we can't do this. So what's wrong with our process that we didn't have a chance to get really familiar with all of this yeah. and have a chance to discuss it? We had time to read it, but barely. And, you know, I... I'm going to take responsibility for that. It's my fault that you didn't have the time. That's why I voted no. I, I, can't, I won't put my name onto something that I haven't. You should not. I won't do that. Mm -hmm. That's just personal values. Okay. Let's move on to uh, item 10.1, update on the superintendent president's search. And... Um, I don't know whether Dr. Benjamin wants to address this, or would you like me to address it? <laughs> Are you leaving on December 31? Okay. Just thought I'd give you a chance. To... Um, so I think tomorrow the screening committee, do I have that right, Patricia? Tomorrow the screening committee is um, uh, interviewing semi-finalists. That's all I can say. And. And then uh, once they have presented or selected to send to the, uh, the board, the finalist, there will be a community forum on October 24th at Garvin where each of the finalists will make a presentation and be subject to questions. And then the following day, uh, the, the board will be um, meeting and interviewing each uh, candidate, each finalist uh, separately, and perhaps even <coughs> coming to a decision that day. So, any questions? Um, okay, so item 10.2 is the agenda, uh, or, I'm sorry, is the, uh, well, it's the board planning calendar for 2019-20? Yes, sir. This is just a recommendation. The cabinet worked on it. Uh, you will recall that you gave us um, topics you wanted uh, discussed and some detail of reports you wanted. And then Angie spent some time going back through old agendas to see what comes up every month. And so we're just trying to organize ourselves with something like this. We're wondering if you are interested in it, in having such a document. And then if you would like, if you are interested in it, are there enhancements you'd like to make or whatever? If you do, then we need to figure, you change your office, you have your annual organizational meeting in December. So we could do it one of two ways. We could start it July 1 to June 30, or we could do it on a calendar year, January to, you know, to December. That's up to you. I think this is really nice. <laughs> it's, I mean, it gives us um, a, I mean, it doesn't, it, I, I assume it's like a living document. We, we can yes. change it all the time, but, mm -hmm. but it at least gives us a heads up of what's coming down the road and what we got to be thinking about. So for that reason, I, I like it. Trustee Abu. Um, one, one, this is awesome. We've never had anything like this. Uh, we've always had the future agenda items, but they never got scheduled. Um, but one suggestion I would make is in May or June to have a legislative update so we can stay, I know there's a budget, there was a budget update in here, but okay. uh, just the bills that are going through the legislature that affect us would be good to have, if we want to take a position. So I think you're looking for feedback. Any other yeah. feedback, Trustee yeah. Croninger? Well, I certainly like it too, especially, however, that we recognize flexibility because things do come up. Right. Um, 
<clears throat> I would ask for a regular, I mean, given where we are with the budget, a regular budget update that we just have one every time. Um, here's where we are every month. It doesn't have to be lengthy, but, and, and with that probably goes enrollment updates. Um, so we understand if anything's changing there. Anything else? Trustee Parker. I just want to say thank you. I'm, this is this is really terrific, super helpful. Um, I I think that if this were starting fresh, that probably I would like it to run ju the July calendar yeah. from July to July. But um, you know, running as it is from September as a start, I think that that wherever we've started is also a good yeah. way just to keep it going. I just started here because yeah. mm -hmm. September. Mm -hmm. yeah. July, I, I assume maybe you're thinking <laughs> July, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, July to July makes sense. We or, or ordinarily have our retreat in June mm -hmm. and we're kind of, that's kind of a that's planning what, meeting in a way. So. Yeah, that's I, what I wanted to yeah. ask you about because you had it in August. So we put it in August, but to me it makes more, I mean, it seems that you would have it in June. I think it had to do with vacations when it gets scheduled. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to set a, a month that you want to have that annually? I think it's good. I think things your calendar get done. You know, right? <laughs> if yeah. it's in you your want June book. or August. Mm -hmm. June makes more sense. I think right June. before June vacation. Makes more sense. Because you're doing your evaluation and yeah. all that stuff on the prior year. So we'll move that, mm -hmm. that to June then, mm -hmm. the retreat. I have a quick question. Yes. Is this assuming a two meeting per month agenda or a one meeting per month agenda? <coughs> I, I, we didn't not, think about not, it that not, way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No so this is whatever this is, this is. It doesn't matter whether you have one or two, then things would be on whatever yeah. the appropriate okay. agenda would be. Okay. The only thing I thought about for planning, because so when you look at the governing board agenda, master planning, that's strictly, solely, ultimately, a lot of the time falls on the board chair. And so, like, would we want to add, you know, when we have to have our meeting to set, you know, who the labor negotiator is for a superintendent? And I just feel like those, God forbid, Angie ever leaves. I just feel like you are so on top of, like, the one wonderful employee we have to remind us, wait, you guys got to get the review in and the, set all this stuff back. And so I just remember backtracking into it. And it does have to start. And if this serves as a good cheat sheet for us to know, wait, we have to put that in. I don't know, what do you think, Robert? I, I feel like it's, I know when you and I met and I had my little book and you know I had it all written down, but for us to know, oh yeah, by June we should have this on the agenda to know that we have to appoint a labor negotiator. Okay, by this day we need to have met in closed session to. I mean, have some additional deadlines that. Uh, for the evaluation yeah. of the superintendent president because yeah, that season that is really be. busy for us. Yeah. And so I just feel like, again, God forbid Angie ever leaves, but Angie's the one that. So we need to that's what we want. I, I want think so because yeah. it is it does it will help so that then our superintendent can then plan his or her life and then they leave and we want them to leave. Well, to we'll vacation. make a separate closed session. One. Yeah, and just those dates for this. yeah when yeah. we. Right, but there's a, there's a process there that takes a couple months just to go through it. Um, so we should calendar it so we get started on time. You mean the superintendent president's evaluation? Right. Yeah, right. yeah yes. like those, because we always have an item just evaluation. And so it, there's usually a number of them because you have to lead up to July. Well, you're going to need a different kind of schedule for your n new person to yeah. start out because the person's starting. Right, right. Year. Do you yeah. want me to work on something? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for volunteering to do more and more every time. <laughs> <laughs> Bless your heart. She's going to quit volunteering if you keep bringing that up. Well, I'm trying to help you as much as I can before I go. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. You. I know. <laughs> okay, we're going to move to report from board members. Do Does anybody have any re, anything to report? I trust, trust you, Abood. I, I met with um, one of the women who's working with Jacqueline Inda on the diversion program, and I learned a lot about it, and I thought it was... It's a great idea, and so I'd, lo I'd love to learn more about it at a f either future board meeting or any other mechanism. It, it, I think they've got a good program going, and us being a part of it would really help our students. Good. I'd like to hear more, more about it as well. An anybody else? 
I just, I continue to follow the dual enrollment um, so closely, closely because it's in my home, because I have children um, and just, you know, folks in the community. Um, and so obviously I'm a parent for Santa Barbara Unified. And so I just want to uh, update the board. I, I still, I think we, I would love for us to get a dual enrollment um, agenda so we can really talk about it. But in just, um, I think that there is great interest in our community for our local education agencies, be it, you know, Carpinteria, San Inez, to really move in the direction of awarding um, high simultaneously awarding high school credit at the same time the University of California awards credit for fulfilling an A through G requirement. And I just feel like that is a common goal we all share with uh, successful entry and completion to uh, careers that is uh, so integral to our economy, whether it's certificates or advanced degrees. Um, and so I continue to work on that and, um, and I know Gosh, Melissa's amazing, and her team's amazing, and and I see as I've re and I've really dug into this, um, and I with guided pathways, I think that there's just such a great opportunity for us to really work with our local education agencies. So maybe when we schedule a joint board meeting with Carpinteria, Santa Barbara Unified, uh, maybe that would be an appropriate time. But um, I think there's certainly some great benefit, and what Luce highlighted in the community report of the dual enrollment spread. I mean, certainly that is just phenomenal what these students are accomplishing under this great program. And last week, was it last week, Jonathan? I think Governor Newsom uh, signed uh, to extend Holden's yes. bill. Was it last week? November or October 5th or something. So that's all great news and everybody um, is on board. Uh, I've been following the, counts the UC counselors updates with regard to dual enrollment in high schools and just a lot of innovation across California to really straighten partnerships with community colleges as that has been the one thing proven to reduce time, money, um, all those wonderful things. Thank you. I, I just got one, before I forget it, one thing to report for the benefit of people in the audience, because um, everybody else up here was there. We had a really good public forum uh, last week at the SHOT Center. We had a surprisingly strong uh, turnout. They heard from all of us individually, and I thought it was a good evening. We got some good questions from the, uh, from the audience and a good discussion. Trustee Abood. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment on the sad news that we heard of the passing of a student. And I was just earlier today at Isla Vista Community Network meeting where that issue came up. And I think what I would like, this is kind of going back to the previous item, but I'd like to also learn more, more, more about our orientation practices and how we orient our students as they're coming into City College just to see you know, where we have maybe some gaps in our education on alcohol and other drugs because it's become a very regular occurrence in, in Isla Vista and in other parts of the district, and I'd really like to see us do our part in preventing issues like this. Anything else? Trustee Nielsen? Yeah, you beat me to it, Jonathan. Thank you for bringing that up. It's really important, <laughs> and there, there are efforts being made in the community, you know, by other groups and people to, uh, to address that. There's even private individuals trying to do things about it. And uh, the suicide rate going way up, and the abuse of drugs and alcohol is there. And I, there's a, a good number of, uh, of uh, Isla Vista residents that seem to fall off that cliff out there every year. And um, I don't know what we can do about it, but we can do something rather than not much. We, we need to address that kind of thing. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about tonight, when it was kind of my turn here to do this, is um, more work for our communications department. Um, I, we, to communicate with the public at large. Yes. And let's just pick one subject, because it just came up, uh, <clears throat> about dual enrollment. You know, I can envision a whole series of articles as press releases to the, to the, to the press, to the media out here. Um, some could be audio, visual, some can be written. Um, they can do things on it, the offering of support to help them create something. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a great local interest. And this college, who I'm proud to be a minor part of here, um, we have so many good things to look at and we disagree about a whole bunch of other little tiny things, but we don't disagree on why we're here and what we're trying to accomplish. And 
I think we need to be talking a lot more about the positive things that we do. And so I would really like to see an effort on um, you know, focusing periodically on different subjects. And I can't think of a better place to start maybe than the dual enrollment program, getting the public's attention, getting them to look at us and see it. Um, the, uh, what we offer in the way of uh, trade education, um, there's construction stuff going on at different centers, there's the marine technology, there's all kinds of neat stuff we could do. So I could go on for an hour, but I won't because we still have another meeting after this. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Um, well, I think we can now move on to item 11.1 uh, that uh, Liz has already highlighted for us, and Lindsay <coughs> Moss is coming down, I believe, to lead the discussion. Good evening again. Now it is evening. I kept saying evening before because I'm always used to being here at night. Okay, so this was a very exciting process, doing the negotiations with CSCA with Liz. Thank you for highlighting it earlier. I appreciate that. We started in 2018 working on the process. I was on the negotiations team from the beginning, but as she mentioned, midway, I ended up becoming the chief negotiator. So we worked together to finalize all of these TAs. We spent a considerable amount of time, as you can probably tell, going through the language in the contract and making updates in many different areas. So I could talk about these for hours because it took us hours to do them. So I'm not sure how much information the board is looking for. I'll just start with a high level overview and then maybe you want to ask me questions as we go. Um, some of my highlights I want to make is that in terms of salaries, that negotiation was done a while ago. That was for the prior year, the 7% increase that the board approved before. We did not negotiate salaries for 1920. So there's nothing in here regarding uh, salary impacts for 1920. And the host of all of the other adjustments you see in the language in these TAs weren't particularly about salary or compensation type issues. Most of them were more about looking at the contract and incorporating maybe some legal statutes that we needed to add for things that had changed over the last couple years, or removing old language that wasn't applicable, references to 1967 that don't apply because that type of review hadn't been done in a while. And uh, also going through and documenting a lot of the changes that we had been working to make between human resources and the managers and employees and making sure that we had everything documented that we had been just kind of verbally talking about. Things like our telecommuting guidelines. Many employees have done telecommuting for a long time, but we didn't have a form related to that, and we didn't have the language around that built into the contract. So that was kind of the bulk of what a lot of the negotiations were about, were things that we know that we've been having our employees do, flexible schedules, compressed schedules, and beefing up the language in the contract to make sure that it reflects our practices. Um, one of the specific changes we made was in the vacation section, um, clarifying. We had a lot of communication about how we encourage our employees to take their vacation time, but how can we get them to take it? Because a lot of employees aren't taking it, and then they're going over their bank. Um, so we clarified some of the language in there, threw out some language that had been put in there a few years ago in a previous round of negotiations. We're trying a new tactic to really um, encourage our employees to make sure they take that well-needed um, rest time, that vacation time. We also created a new evaluation form for classified staff and incorporated that new evaluation form in the contract. Um, and a host of other very, very small changes. So these tentative agreements, we worked through and signed, and CSEA um, at their headquarters have agreed to these. So uh, if the board approves these this evening, they will be worked into the actual contract, and the new contract will have all this language in it. Any questions? No questions? No? Okay. Okay. 
I also really want to thank the CSEA team. It was a wonderful team to work with. We had Carlos Macias, who has been with the district for a very long time. He just retired. And uh, Jason Thornell and Lauren Mindel and Liz Auchincloss and Mary Saragossa and also their representative from CSEA, Mark Moore. We just had a, a wonderful, wonderful time working together. It was very collaborative. It was like you didn't know who side of the table you were on. We just worked as a team to try and make the contract better for, for all of us. So Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, of Liz's perspective, I just what you said, I just keep hearing. You said despite the ups and downs, you're grateful to be here. So if that heart resonates with the rest of the crew, um, I think we're in good shapes. Um, I move to approve the California Employee Associ Association Chapter 289 tentative agreement for the 2018-21. Is there a second? Any comments? Before we go vote, Trustee Abeshi, do you have any advisory <laughs> vote for us? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> well, okay. He's not voting, it's an advisory. <laughs> um, Okay, so all those in favor? Do we have to, is this a roll no, call? Okay. okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Yay. <laughs> okay, item uh, 12.4. 4, fall 2019 enrollment. Good evening. After your State of the College presentation, Dr. Benjamin asked me to bring additional data information, and so you have a hard copy version that is different than what was included in the agenda. We made that available at the front door, and it'll be available in our minutes for folks looking at this a little bit later. But one of the questions was a percentage of headcount across the categories of enrolled students that people were interested in when we visited with them at, at SHOT. So Can I just say that we got a public comment, and you guys, within a matter of like a week, addressed it? Of course. Can we just say thank you? And this You're college welcome. is just on it. So maybe that'll be the first tweet loose that we took feedback from the community and, and our folks got on it. Thank we you. We rocked on it. <laughs> so the Institutional Research Office has been working to track data around enrollment for years. And you've seen a variety of enrollment reports. We were working all the time to kind of improve that data and make it a little clearer. There was a question about whether or not we might want a monthly enrollment report. Enrollment has certain moments where it becomes static. And so we track that data on census dates. So it's probably most useful at, at precise moments in a semester. So what I'm reporting to you is our first census date, which is about uh, two weeks into a semester. It occurs at the 20% point. That makes the most conservative data. So what you're taking a look at right now is credit enrollment at the census date in an, at an early moment in September. In uh, November, we'll be bringing you enrollment data on non-credit because those, those are positive attendance. And so you've looked at those before. We use a predictive measure to try to predict what that will look like based on previous data. But this year, we're trying to get that even more finely tuned, so we'll be bringing that separately. Um, so these are categories you're familiar with that we've been tracking over time. And you can see that right now, we're at a negative 3% in headcount. So that's different than our FTS, our full-time equivalent students, which I have not included here. On that new calendar that you saw for the Board of Trustees, we've proposed bringing um, information for you on strategic enrollment management in December. So we'll be bringing information from a newly formed committee and our efforts on increasing uh, more effective strategies for strategic enrollment management. And in that presentation, we'll be talking to a great deal about how full-time equivalent students um, help us generate the apportionment for the institution and what that looks like when we think about that in economic and um, educational terms. Any questions? <coughs> Dr. Walton, census is 10 days or two week, like 14? So if you're thinking about it in terms of dates, that first census is about two weeks in. It's 20% so, of a semester. Okay. So at the 20% mark. Yes, um, Trustee Croninger. On uh, the FTS number? Yes. 
Where are we? So it's a number that continues to evolve over time. In fact, we were just backward reporting FTS for 1819, um, which was good news. So that was that's always positive. We're always happy to scrape them up. We're down somewhere around two percent at this point. And say that again. We're down about two percent. We think that number will increase over time because of dual enrollment, which tends to register much later, and we track those pieces in more complex ways. So this is always kind of the worst case scenario what you're looking at right now. It fairly well tracks units correctly. It does, but because FTS has a component that is part of weekly student contact hours, when you're thinking about units, and this is one of those things that I'll talk to us about a little more in depth in December, you can have a lecture unit, which is a one-hour lecture contact, so you're only with the student for one hour. If you have a lab unit, that's a three-hour equivalent of that student contact. So when you're looking straight at, at unit numbers like you're here, um, it doesn't tell you the whole story. Okay. This does tell you a conservative story, which at this point in our budget analysis is probably not a bad place for us to be. Okay. So as we update our budget, we will update the pieces that are affected by enrollment yes. to our best ability. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Dr. Ralston, too, I know it's been a goal to capture 100% of our dual enrollment students. So it, how is that our local education agencies uh, helping them figure out a better way? The priority is, yes, we need the money for the headcount, but the priority is so that the kids obviously get credit if they don't fill out that silly form. I mean, is it a form? Is it a box? So how, what, what can we do to help motivate our local education agencies to help the kids just get the thing done so they get credit? So that's a project that we're working on all the time. So we've worked to streamline as many parts of the process internally as we can. We have an ongoing project between um, dual enrollment, outreach, and retention. So we're working to kind of amplify what that looks like and improving our technology pieces. How we train and communicate back with the USDs is really crucial. And so that's a piece that's been kind of an ongoing conversation. Melissa Moreno's worked on that component. Dr. Benjamin's done some outreach with the USDs. That's a part of the work that we're doing. When you spoke about guided pathways, guided pathways reaches way down. And so what we want to really be thinking about is that pipeline for student success. Okay. So that's part of our work in guided pathways. That's part of our student equity plan. Mm -hmm. um, it's really how we're thinking about the vision for student success goals overall. So yes, yes, and yes. Thanks. I have Thanks. a quick question here. Yeah. Um, as you look at the next um, semester and you're watching enrollment drop, um, how is the college planning to estimate the n numbers into the future? <laughs> So are you asking me about spring 2020, or are you asking spring me about Spring 2020 and forward? beyond, um, uh, the, the numbers have never seemed to be based on anything specific um, that, that we can see. Um, uh, so we spend a lot of time thinking um, in short historical frames. Uh -huh. So we look at back at scheduling that we've developed over time, and then we do kind of a seat estimation. So we do internal pieces about scheduling and enrollment. We look um, into K-12 data to see how many students are coming into a system, how many students are graduating. That is one of those pieces where we try to build our own pipeline. So we know that there's a reduction in the number of students. We talked about this last week, yeah. actually, right? Reduction in the number of students in the K-12 system as a whole in our service area. So we try to think about a variety of variables. And then when we're working to kind of make sure that everybody's accessing the institution, we're also thinking about something that's even harder to track, which is returning adult students. And so later this semester, you'll be hearing from our folks talking about grants. And so we have a grant that's actually particularly interested in a returning non-traditional student. And that's a hard thing to, to predict. How many would that be? So um, there's not a formula, or you couldn't create a formula. Um, it's kind of um, best guessing based on historical patterns and incoming data. Yes. Okay. I'd like yes, best guessing. I mean, it yeah. is. It's a. There's a little bit of science and a little bit of art. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And then our retention from. Our retention rates from fall to spring are actually particularly high for mm -hmm. a community college in California. So there are other things that we base into that, who stays with us. And it's effort when we think pedagogically about the great things that happen inside our classes and what happens with our faculty, is students who stay are much easier to be able to predict about. It's also more beneficial economically. It's also way better for students in our community. So mm -hmm. retention is a key focus for us. 
Okay. Any other questions? Thanks for I, the numbers. Thank you. I'd like to stay up and be able to introduce our next report. Sure. If you don't mind. And they waited quite patiently. So I'd like to introduce to you Laura Ferris and Lacey Peterson are going to come from our student health and wellness area to present to you on a, a request that you made during your retreat, which is now also built into that calendar we'll be thinking about. We also have with them as a support element, Rebecca Bean, who's one of our new hires. She's been helping us with the well. You'll be hearing about that tonight. So thanks for being here with us, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks very much to you too. Trustee Miller, I'm just gonna step out for a little break. Okay. I noticed you did. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. And Dr. Benjamin and Board of Trustees, we have a quick overview of our services in student health and wellness. And um, I'm very happy to have my friends and colleagues here with me, Lacey and Becky. And um, please, we'll have time for questions. Student health and wellness, you haven't heard us during your budget discussions because we have our own funding. And you've seen me here before asking you to support our funding, and you have. Thank you very much. We're in good shape in student health and wellness. And our um, health fee is set, the cap is set by the Chancellor's Office. It is currently at $21 a semester and $18 in the summer. And um, in the year 2018, your board approved us. When the Chancellor's Office says we can raise the fee, you approved an automatic raise for that. So thank you very much. Um, we offer free medical and counseling services. We have sexual health services. We have a wonderful relationship with Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinics. They come twice a week and provide sexual health services for us. We provide at-cost medications and tests. The students love the free over-the-counter medications and condoms we have. And we have a wonderful counseling and wellness program. We'll go into these in detail. First, we'll go into our basic medical services. We have nurses and nurse practitioners. We have a nurse practitioner every day, and she can write prescriptions. And we also have um, prescription medication in our clinic. We're like a little urgent care center is what we are. Um, we have over-the-counter supplies, which it's amazing how appreciative students are of just bandages, like to have sort of a place they can go on campus that where they can get a Tylenol or a bandage. Just the little things sometimes can mean a lot. We provide the student accident insurance on campus, and that um, policy is about $30,000 a year. So we pay that, student health and wellness pays that premium. Um, we have first aid right as we were coming over today. There was a student who was riding his bike on campus in his Birkenstocks, and a student in front of him had her earbuds in, and he, she didn't hear him coming, and he had to go into the curb, and he like tore his toenail off. So those things, you'd be amazed how often we see. We're, we're the nurse's office. We're where they come to get bandaged up and then flu shots and TB screening. Um, across the nation, what do you think the number one reason students come into any college student health center? <coughs> it's mm -hmm. upper respiratory, and it really goes in waves, you know, and they, it's just like um, almost predictable. So allergies, strep throat, um, asthma, we can administer <laughs> asthma treatment. So that's really, we're very aware of uh, hand washing among our staff. We all get our flu shots because that's really um, the most common thing we see. How many students did our nurses see last year? How many appointments? We had almost 2,500 appointments. And those, uh, the data is through our electronic medical records. How many um, appointments did Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinics provide? And that was almost 500, and we're really working at in increasing those this year. And now I'm going to let Lacey, who's a faculty marriage and family therapist, talk about our counseling. Thank you. This is my first time at a board meeting, so 
Let me know if I'm loud enough. I'm all nervous. Um, so I'm Lacey Peters. I'm one of the two mental health full-time counselors that work here on this campus. We are a very busy counseling center. So um, you did a shout out earlier to the professional volunteers. We have 12 of them that are postdoc students, pre-doc students, and um, associates that are getting their hours towards MFT and LCSW licensure. So we, um, we, we love our professional volunteers, so thank you for, for mentioning that. I was, I, was, I was very touched by the fact that you, you mentioned that. So um, personal counseling, we, um, some of the top mental health challenges we're seeing today, um, we see a lot of depression, anxiety, We've had a, uh, the, the acuity of our, of our, of our students have, has gone up. So we have actually changed our, our assessment forms and we're doing a different type of triaging because um, we're seeing an increase in crisis um, and that is, that is uh, across the board nationally with college students. So we have um, changed the way we intake our students to meet the needs of every student that walks through our door every single day. So. Um, we look at each of those forms. Allison or myself sign off on those forms, and we make sure every student is taken care of appropriately. And um, some of the things um, that we also deal with are um, eating disorders, grief and loss, and addiction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, I was, I'm actually an addictive disorder specialist. I worked at UCSB for a decade under the alcohol and drug program. So um, I'm very... Um, knowledgeable about um, all that's going on in the Isla Vista community and work very closely with community um, ties and I'll be talking about our response to the alcohol and drug stuff that's going on on our campus. So in terms of mental health support, every student that walks through our door gets an assessment and based on that assessment, we, um, we either decide to keep them in-house, keep a student in-house with us, or we get them to the appropriate level of care they may need. So some people need um, you know, just a couple of counseling sessions. Other people need weekly sessions. Other people need intensive outpatient programs. Other people need in inpatient programs. And we know how to get them everywhere. We um, work very closely to make sure that every student gets their needs met and um, we work closely with the Holman Group, which is a provider for people that have SenCal and Medi-Cal. So we are very um, knowledgeable on a wide range of um, treatment modalities. Additionally, everything is research-based, evidence-based, and we use um, assessment tools and interventions that are all um, appropriate for college students. Um, we do have a substance use and recovery counseling program through our anchor program. We have um, interns that are given, that are vetted for us through our chair um, of the alcohol and drug counseling program, Gordon Colburn. And he brings forward a couple of interns every year and we bring them on and they work with students that are struggling with um, any type of alcohol or drug. Um, issue for free as long as they've paid their fee and we'll work with them as long as it takes. Um, we also work to get them um, into longer term care if that's needed. Um, we also um, offer support groups, empowerment groups and workshops in the well. And just some numbers on that. Last fall we had a soft opening of the well and we had, um, we did t in four months we did 26 workshops in 45 support groups. And just this semester, we've done 12 workshops and 30 support groups. So, um, and this is all again through a lot of our student volunteer, or our professional volunteers. Um, we also, Allison and myself are a part of the BIT team and Laura. We're all part of the behavioral intervention team and we respond to students of concern every day. Um, and we attend to safety concerns and we work with the police and we have an, um, a really good relationship with Cottage Hospital, Vista Del Mar, and, um, and county, the, the County of Behavioral Wellness. So we work very closely with our community members and we know them, we have them on our cell phones and we work, we work very close. Um, we also um, will go over some of the community agencies and providers that we, that we work with. And we also offer a ton of community referrals to students based on what they um, need. So what do you think the number one factor affecting academic performance is for students? I heard it. Yeah, Pamela got it. 
So stress, 34% of students report that this is the number one thing affecting them. And let me say one thing, this is data from the National College Health Assessment, which we participate in every three years, and it, we're a cohort with all the California community colleges. And it's fascinating data. You can see what our students, how they um, are doing their health. Look at California Community College students and then the national cohort. So I'm going to get our individual data in the next few weeks. We did it last spring. And I'd love to come back and present that to you because it's very interesting. Um, what percent of students did something they regretted after they drank alcohol? Again, this is another um, number by NCHA. 31% of male and female students both. And that's pretty, that's um, again average, that's consistent with the national average. So um, sometimes I, I think we get, um, especially in Santa Barbara, we get kind of a bad rap. But um, we are, our numbers are very consistent. And, and in terms of UCSB, I know that um, we're just a little, they were just a little higher than the national average, but not much. How many appointments did the counselors have in 2018, 2019? 2,751. So we have over 100 counseling appointments available every week, and we are booked. At the same time, we never have more than a week, about a week wait. So um, we do see students faster than, than most counseling centers, and, um, and we offer crisis times every day. So we just tell students, if you're in crisis, walk in, we will triage. So um, we got very, we, we, we got blessed, I would say, with being able to take more of a prevention route instead of an intervention route, which mental health to me can be more of an intervention. And so we have what's called the wellness center, which is called the well. And the well is mimicked after um, a UC, um, Riverside that has a, another wellness program called The Well, and we called them and asked them if we could use their name because we thought it was really cute, and they said yes. So um, at The Well, we again, we opened last year, thanks to Becky being up there, and um, she did a soft opening, and again, I gave you some of those numbers. Some of the things we do there, we offer um, psychoeducational workshops and empowerment groups, which we call support groups, and they are... Um, there, there's a wide array, a wide array of sort support groups. We have um, support groups for um, supporting trans students, LGBTQIA students, um, male. We have a men's men's group. We offer um, recovery support. We have an AA meeting on campus. Um, we have our anchor program office, which we have drop-in hours for those who are struggling with alcohol and drug stuff. Um, so we offer a lot of things in the well. We also do a ton of classroom presentations on health topics and we do have health interns that work with us that are students and go into the classrooms and give presentations. We do campus outreach and events. So um, we have um, a de-stress fest every, every semester and, um, and we're out there um, doing events on a um, monthly basis. We also table on a weekly basis. Um, our anchor interns table typically once a week. Um, we have collaborations with SBCC and community partners often. Um, we are also collaborating um, with EOPS um, and doing monthly workshops with um, Guardian Scholars and Spark, and we're doing a CalFresh training coming up. And we offer just, just also, um, the well is just a nice welcoming environment for students to just be. So it looks kind of like a living room and then we have like bean bags in the back. And like I went in today and there was like two kids, two students like napping, like all like sprawled out and taking a quick nap between classes. So it's a really nice place. We offer also some nutritional snacks and um, you know, tissues and just things that you may need. Like it's kind of like a nice little home away from home and um, a little sanctuary for students on campus. So come and check it out if you're ever on, on campus and you want to jump in a beanbag chair or take a nap. <laughs> um, how many students access the WELL program in the spring is the question. And we had 900 students come through in four months, so that's pretty good. And I'm going to turn it back over to Laura to talk a little bit about a mental health grant that we were awarded um, last year. Um, last year, the Chancellor's Office awarded a mental health grant to every um, 
community college campus based on enrollment. And our grant was about $110,000. So the grant was is to focus on suicide prevention and mental health. And so we've just been having a really exciting and challenging and rewarding time um, providing activities and um, programs using this grant. Um, in September, we had a suicide prevention uh, event at the Marjorie, Hine, uh, Marjorie Luke Theater. We presented Kevin Hines, a young man who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. And he, the minute he let, pushed off that bridge, he knew he wanted to live. So he's a very inspirational speaker. And we had 350 people. It was a community event, and we were really excited. We had 10 community ta um, partners tabling. We had refreshments, and it was a, it was a really beautiful, exciting evening. And um, I want to thank the college for letting us um, administer and, and utilize that grant. Um, tomorrow, in this very room, we're going to have a hundred of our staff and em our employees in this room with a training by a phenomenal man named Dr. Brian Van Brunt on um, s disruptive student behaviors, managing disruptive student behaviors, suicide prevention, and preventing staff burnout. So we're so excited, and we're, we want to thank Dr. Um, I mean, we want to thank our Dean Arturo because we're closing the student services building so that the staff can ha come and they're so excited we're going to provide lunch. I mean it's amazing how little things mean so much to people that you're, you're an important employee and we're investing in you by giving you this day. So we're, we're doing that tomorrow. Um, in the spring, we're going to do this amazing um, exhibit called Send Silence Packing, where they have backpacks from, I forget how many students, 1,600 students who have committed suicide. On a year, and they lay their backpacks out on the Great Meadow, and there's little information um, pieces on the student and their life, and notes on the backpack, and it's very powerful. Um, we have um, uh, purchased an online health magazine called Student Health 101, and Becky has been working really hard to get that up. And that's, we really want to be aware of our online only students that we have services for them too, and that's a monthly health magazine. We've increased our um, direct one-on-one -on -one services for underrepresented students with this grant. We're able to actually um, pay um, uh, therapists to come in to, for specific groups who we aren't always able to provide for. And we're gonna increase our suicide and depression risk assessments. So we're having a lot of fun. And um, these are just a list of some of our community partners. As a community college, we really need to involve our community in taking care of the health of our students. So this is just a list of some of the wonderful people we work with. And that's our presentation. Well, thank you, thank you very much. I just want to thank you, first of all, for an excellent presentation, but also thank you for the good valuable and critical services that you provide for our students. It, uh, I really enjoyed hearing this. Anybody have Anybody have comments or I, I Dr. Haslin? I had a question. It's something you said early in the presentation that there's uh, nation, nationwide uh, an increase in anxiety, Crisis. stress, or whatever. Yeah, depression, anxiety, there's an increase in suicide as well. Right, and, and the trick question is, to what do you attribute this? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> I think it's um, a lot of things. I, I, think that, um, I think that the state of the world is scary right now. And I think that um, people um, also, you know, are just having a hard time coping just I think coping is a big thing like 
you know, what do you do when you feel sad? Um, I think technology plays a role personally, but that's, I don't have any evidence to support that. And, um, you know, I think, um, I think that just, I mean, the students that come in our office all have such different stories, but there's just a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear of the unknown. And, um, I don't know my, my answer is, I mean, I'm, I think the answer is love. So I think we just have to show a lot of love to people and people need more of it. And I think there needs to be more community and you find love and belonging and community. And so I think that we're trying as, as health and wellness to bring more community to this campus. And we're finding that the well's working and that's a really big positive thing. And so we're hoping to do more of that. I don't know if that helps, but it's just my genuine well, thank you very, very much. Can I come in and slouch on your beanbag? Or? Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Trustee Lou? Yeah. So I, I want to thank you also for the great work you do. Um, one question that someone in the community raised to me um, about a month ago, and I, I sent this to Dr. Benjamin already, but I just wanted to ask now is, on our website it says to get contraception you need to be over 18 years old and someone had brought that to me as you know they they had an issue with that and I just wanted to verify I would just want to know where on that what the website it it's says that on we can do that page, on the health and wellness okay. sexual it's services it's not true it's not true no, okay it's not true that's good to know um, it's not true. okay for the emergency contraception yeah. too because it's right. specifically on that one okay thank you so much if yeah, that can, can be changed can pop on in and we'll We'll Help them out. That. Great. Yeah, thank we can thank fix you. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Trustee Croninger. I just wanted to say thank you too. Um, I remember when you came before us with the health fee and talked about the chance to come and tell us more about the program. So I've been looking forward to that. And um, I'm sure you probably know, but you are one of the focuses in our board goals for this year. So hearing about this is is part of something we really wanted to do. I like as well that you are named the well, because wells give you water and you can't have life without living water. So I thought that was great too. The fact that you said that you guys are so well connected and so I just want to give a huge heart of gratitude to you guys because for the mental health professionals in the community that I know, they do have these folks on their cell phone and when the cell phone rings, it's dinner, it's Saturday night, you're somewhere and they pick it up and so that's a huge labor of love that you guys are giving to our students along with the huge network of folks in our community. Um, this has been an issue that's been close to our heart and it's, uh, gosh, from access to health care to student mental health, there's so many things that, God forbid, we should experience some of the headlines that other communities have, but the fact that you guys are on the preventative end and building infrastructures of compassion and care and kindness and that that's huge, so thank you. Thank you, and I just want to add that, you know, the community at large is also very supportive of SBCC students. They offer sliding scales. I just got someone into an intensive outpatient program on scholarship because they wanted to help our SBCC community. So um, I think it's, um, those are, it's so important that we have these ties. And just to let you guys know that, you know, we are well loved. You know, our community takes care of us too. We take care of them, so. And then I was just wondering, because I know, you know, just to Jonathan's point, um, but if you've ever met a girl after some emergency contraception or some intervention to some decision, you know the mental health issues that follow those decisions. And so as much as you don't need parental consent, unfortunately, according to the law, um, when you talk to a child, an underage child, or a, a college student who's made that decision, as you know, there are severe mental health issues and trauma that come from that experience. So I'm wondering, in addition to like Planned Parenthood and all the other services, um, is there any, there's also like a um, life network that's in town. And, and so I, when we think of our mission's comprehensive mission statement and when you set, you know, underrepresented students, so I'm thinking Latina girls, Catholic, mm -hmm. um, and so just some of those values, if there is other options before, uh, well, yeah, we usually, um, we, I mean, all of our therapists are highly skilled, and so we um, tend to meet the client where they're at, and we never enforce our values onto anybody, and so we tend to, you know, 
help people. We use a motivational interviewing, which is a therapeutic technique to figure out what the client wants and what the what the and to see how the client feels, and then to offer appropriate community resources. So, awesome. um, you know, we we try to meet every client's needs as appropriately as possible, and you know, may that be whatever way they're maybe going, or if they're feeling confused. Yeah. Um, we will work with that ambivalence and um, get them the support that they may need. I appreciate you. Thank you. Trustee Abeshi. Um, I want to thank you all. You guys are doing a wonderful job. And I just want to thank you on behalf of all the students. Um, I have two questions. Sure. Um, there's a lot of resources on campus, but students are not aware of them because City College has a high rate of turnovers and students, new students are always coming in. Is there a way you can work with faculty to have like your information on their syllabus so students, like when you're stressed, this is where to go? Because faculty has like, they're in touch with every student on campus, so that would be a great way to inform them. That also. is a great idea. Yeah, I mean, to have it on every syllabus would be wonderful. We do do we do send out an email to all faculty offering our workshops, and we say, can we come into your class for five to ten minutes and just share a little bit about our program? So we do ask faculty every semester, and some faculty decide to do it. Others defer, but we do offer, and um, the syllabus idea is awesome. Um, you know, I think as, um, you know, I was, um, as Jonathan was talking earlier about how, you know, there's the orientation piece of guided pathways and how um, students onboarded this campus. I was on the grassroots part of um, F Gaucho FYI, which was a first year experience orientation for students at UCSB. And I helped to make a lot of the um, curriculum that's there that they use. And um, I think it's important that there is some sort of an or orientation process where students do get to um, really familiarize themselves with all of the support services on campus and um, think that that will be helpful in the future. And I know that's kind of what they've been working towards. So I'm hoping that we're all moving towards the same goals together. Yeah, uh, my second question is, uh, oh, yeah. 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 yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. I just wanna thank you for letting me join. <laughs> Colleagues, um, we have had many teachers reach out to us and want to bring their classes to the well. Mm -hmm. So we've seen an increase, I think, this partnership between you know not only the professors, the staff, all employees on campus, and wanting to get connected with student health and wellness and the new well. And so we've done tours. Um, we had actually yesterday two classes of 40 students come and fit inside and uh, we did a presentation so I think the word is spreading uh, we had originally uh, created a, a special website to promote the well and where students can sign up for these very dynamic um, important well, uh, wellness workshops and support groups as well as we've asked um, there's a page for professors to say I'm interested in having these informational sessions so we're doing our best to get the word out there. Great. Um, how do you handle a student at the beginning of the semester who hasn't paid the health, the health fee but has like a medical situation and wants to say counselor because during the beginning of the semester there's like a lot of anxiety and stress. Mm -hmm. How would you handle such students? We do. We handle them all the time. Oh, okay. We usually we usually see them anyway, and okay. we try to figure out what's going on with the health fee. Sometimes it's a little hiccup with like you know the promise or something. It's sometimes just a little hiccup. So we try to help figure out what's going on for them and remove that barrier. Um, but if it's a crisis, it's never an issue. We're going to see a student no matter what. And if it's a healthy issue, we try to figure out what the what the problem is and okay. figure out a solution. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, um, I just want to add, you mentioned the training that's happening. Tomorrow morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that's part of the grant that you guys got? Yeah. It's, so, yeah, go for it. No, I, should, I think that I mean the things that you guys are doing to it's great. So that would be something that if we could then sustain um, managing student behavior groups, managing before it escalates. I mean, I feel I mean that is central to student success. Correct. And, and, and yes. so equipping folks to have those skills and mm -hmm. and I just think it'll solve so many problems in terms of students' sense of belonging and feeling and mm -hmm. just knowing how to work in these dynamic groups. And so for faculty, staff, and professors to have those skills mm -hmm. is so important. So I love that it's a grant, but I hope it's something that <laughs> continues. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, I agree. You know, if, it, if we could do something like that annually as part of professional development, yeah. that would be a win. Yeah. 
Thank you so much again Thank for you. all your good work. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we have two. Were we really scary? <laughs> <laughs> So, two more items left on our uh, agenda before we go to closed session. Uh, Twelve point six is report of investment income. How much money we got in the bank? I guess is another way of titling this one. <laughs> yeah, we can change the title for for you for that. I don't actually have anything to report out on that one. Yeah. That is an item that we've added per that new master board calendar, something that we'll be presenting on a regular basis. If so, you want it. Yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. If you have questions, let me know, but I don't think we need to go through it. Anybody have any questions? It's pretty self yeah, it is self-explanatory. <laughs> so it will be just an annual report. But if not, we'll move on to item uh, the last item, which has to do with independent contractor approval process revision, and I think that's yours as well, Lindsay, yes. right? Correct. So I will just be brief, but I wanted to verbally describe the change in the process, which actually the board approved the new report tonight already in the consent agenda, so thank you. And now I'll describe what it is. So we have worked through the independent contractor, consultant, professional expert, process. Those have three different names as outlined in our board policy, but in a nutshell, they all mean about the same thing. They just have some little bit different criteria when you're going through the purchasing process. So we've updated that process with the help of our legal services, Griffith and Thornburg, and created uh, this documentation explaining it. You can read at your leisure. And we have training coming for our employees so they understand the new approval process. So we have a new request form that our employees fill out when they have an independent contractor or professional expert or consultant. And there's two primary thresholds that are of interest to the board. When the contracts are for less than $10,000, those will be coming to the board in just the uh, report. I'm sorry, those ones will not be coming to the board at all because the board policy states that only items over $10,000 are approved by the board. So those you will no longer be seeing unless there's some very special uh, contract that is signed as a part of it. If they just do the typical contract that is um, pre-approved through our legal team, the board won't be seeing those small items. So items that are over $10,000, they sort of have two different uh, paths they can take to the board. If it's over $10,000 and the vendor agrees to sign our new boilerplate contract that legal services wrote for us, then it will come to the board in that contract um, report you saw tonight, that independent contractor report. It intentionally looks just like the PO report to try and keep it simple. So everything you see on that report, those vendors signed the boilerplate contract that legal created. So you wouldn't need to review that contract every time. That boilerplate, boilerplate contract is approved to this agenda item tonight, so you can take a look and see what that is. So that's what those items will be. Additionally, I mentioned this last time, we will be putting all these contracts through our purchase order process so that we can encumber the funds on a budget side. So on the PO report, you'll see that some of these items, you're going to see them twice. You'll see them on the contractor report and then on the PO report, and it will say internal only. It's just for our encumbrance reasons for the budget. So the other route that the board will see is the route that you're more familiar with, where if there's an item over $10,000 and we need the board to approve it, and that vendor did not agree to sign our contract for whatever reason, maybe it's some kind of special service where they need something that's more specialized or we needed something more specialized than that generic contract, those contracts will continue to come to the board the way they always have as a single agenda item with the contract attached for your review. So that's the change is that we'll have this more standardized practice for simplified contracts where you just see them on a report. Everything else you'll see the way you, you used to, and those contracts will always be reviewed by legal services before they come to the board. Thank you for that explanation. It was very helpful. I had a quick You're welcome. Trustee Aboot. Does our new contract and our policies fall in line with Assembly Bill 5 that just passed? You remind me what that is? It's we like a law that changed independent contractor rules. We have to research that. We yeah, are not have to aware look. of it. Okay. 
Thank you. The Uber. <laughs> now I know what the headline is. The Uber. A lot of other industries yeah. are affected. Yeah. I'll double check. Yeah. Trustee Croninger. I was just going to say thank you for organizing this and working this through. Um, it's something that we've needed to do, and I'm really happy to see it here. Um, in the training, do be sure to emphasize that it's not okay for people to just line out stuff on our standard contract. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> we will be careful to make sure that it doesn't happen. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, be before, thank you, Lindsay. Um, before we close our uh, open session, I would like to ask for a moment of silence for student Shane Richmond, who passed away uh, this week. Okay, do we have a motion to uh, adjourn to closed session? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.